Welcome to your sanity safe space with your favorite YouTube podcast duo. Skag 3, whoever he is. Get your quad fascist ass out of here! Saving the millennial generation in weekly installments. You are a terrific team on all counts. Live from a castle tower and his mother's basement, this This is the Matt and Blonde Show. I'll lead an effective strategy to mobilize true international over the person. (laughs) <laughs> hey, why the fuck is the gas so hot, bitch? Out here in the fields, I fight for my meals. We don't, we don't touch our police officers. We're hearing a change when it comes to immigration in general from President Biden on down. It is also directly related to the fact that these were police officers. This hardworking throngs of people in search of hope and a better life. But within that group, there is this one percenter criminal element that looks at a different opportunity here. <laughs> Don't you understand, you dumb son of a bitch? Don't you understand? What the detectives are telling me is they have crews here that operate in New York, do all their stealing, then go to Florida to spend the money and then come back. And I'm like, well, why don't they just stay and steal in Florida? And they said, because there you go to jail. Oh. Oh, my God, bro. Fair play. You are fake news. Go back to where you come from, okay? Very fake news. You suck. Fuck you. Jeez. Come on, man. That was four days ago, five days ago. Fed, 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 fed. All right, America, go to the YouTube right now. Big ups to Rebecca for keeping Matt woke. Congratulations to both of you. You're awesome. Yeah, five, four, three. I can't do it. We'll do it live. (laughs) Fuck it, we'll do it live. Hello and welcome to the show. It is a great show. It is a terrific show. It is a tremendous show. Frankly, the very best you can ask anyone about that. People often do. I'm told this is the Matt and Blonde Show. My name is Matt Christensen. I am flanked on my right, as always, by my wonderful co-host, now mother of two, Blonde. Welcome and congratulations. Thank you so much course we will it's over <laughs> is that the best you can say for it i yeah, i imagine yeah. no one in the world is more relieved than you were this time last week i am uh yeah last saturday yep. well we will get to the baby birth story momentarily of course afterwards plenty of news to discuss tonight as always this image of the migrant guys double fingering the <laughs> the camera guys outside the courthouse it's just a perfect metaphor for the state of the country. I mean, the entire thing, like beating up cops in Times Square, going, getting arrested, being released, no bail, double birds to the camera. And that's with, great. And the story is the plot is only thickening because now it turns out, at least according to law enforcement sources, those guys got on a bus to California by fraudulently obtaining the identities or the immigrant ID numbers of other migrants at the shelter So not only did they just leave and go to California to perpetuate this theft scheme that they have going on, but they actually did it on the taxpayer dime, if the reports are correct. Wow. I would say they're really smart, but they're Venezuelans. So how smart could they possibly be? Smarter than us, or at least more courageous. Our country is getting bent over worse than that guy in the Senate office building who is not charged. That's how bad it is. You had to do it. How many times are you going to say butt sex today? I don't know, but there was a great bit last week uh, when Frank was filling in because we had audience members challenging him to re- to use the word or the phrase in non-forced ways. And uh, he was pretty good at it. I got to give him credit. Fit right and in. And tune in at the end there. I was like, oh, surely they're done with the stream. So I pop in at like 930 and you guys are still streaming. <laughs> what the shit That's how it goes on? with Frank, man. I, uh, you know, he's uh, he's got the gift of gab, but we appreciate his. Uh, he does. I appreciate him filling in. That was so great of him. We love Frank. Yeah. I got to figure out ways to work with him, you know, more in the future. He, it's, you know, he's just a great guy to talk to. So I'll be thinking about opportunities for that. But uh, so we'll talk about talk about the the migrant double middle finger. We'll talk about the uh, the Trump prosecutions. They're slowing down. They're encountering some obstacles. Fannie Willis now admits that she had she has a relationship with this Nathan Wade character. She hired to, uh, she hired to prosecute the Trump racketeering case. Why the, now? The uh, why, well, she has to admit it now because it got busted up through the guy's divorce case. That's yeah, why. I know. But that was like three weeks ago. Because she had a deadline to respond to their filing to have a hearing about it. That's why. Oh. So she took her sweet time while calling everyone racist. That was and kind then, of a good strategy. Uh, 
<laughs> I can't believe it's not working. <laughs> the, the, maybe the judge will schedule a hearing to determine how racist the, uh, the other lawyers are. Uh, also the Trump January 6th trial got delayed. We'll check in with that. Um, Bombing campaigns in the Middle East intensify. It's not just the Houthis, although we did bomb the Houthis again yesterday. But now uh, uh, Iranian-backed militia targets in Iraq and Syria, and uh, we are bombing the Middle East once again to prevent bombing in the Middle East. That is the idea. And it uh, I, supposedly it's succeeding. That's what they say. Plus, we will... Uh, We'll get to some hoax hate. And before we get out of here, tonight's movie review, a week delayed, is Soylent Green. So stick around. We'll catch up with your super chats in between topics as well. Ten bucks and up on the Sunday show because we are no good lowdown money grabbers. Of course, it will be all this and more in your favorite couple hours of listening material. Remember, you can find everything show related and support the show for as little as a buck a month over on the website. That is MattChristensenMedia.com. Listener support is hugely appreciated, and it is what keeps the show operational. So if you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the show. We also have show merchandise for sale on the site. Plus, we have offers from friendly listener-owned businesses as well. This week's feature business is our friends at Western Razor Company. Most razors sold today are made in China by global conglomerates that hate you. Well, Not anymore. The high noon safety razor from Western Razor is made in America with all metal, no plastic, long lasting construction that uses widely available double edge razor blades that only cost pennies each. Safety razors were used by just about every man in America back in the 50s and 60s until the big razor companies figured out they could make more money selling you disposables and signing you up for endless subscriptions. But the safety razor has always been the superior method for a better shave at a lower long-term cost. And don't forget, Western Razor has teamed up with fellow listener-owned business Kenio Mountain Woodsmithing to offer finely crafted wood razor cases as well, available in walnut or maple. You can store or carry your razor with exquisite style and organization, also manufactured right here in the United States of America, of course. Western Razor has all uh, has all your shaving needs covered from razors, uh, razors to blades to accessories to even shave cream. So shave better and less expensively and support American manufacturing. When you pick up a Western Razor, get 10 percent off your entire order using promo code Matt 10. That's promo code Matt 10 for 10 percent off everything from our friends at Western Razor. Find everything you need from Western Razor. Plus, other great offers from the rest of our friendly listener-owned businesses like Hero Soap Company, Phoenix Ammunition, Sonoran Defense Technologies, and more. MattChristensenMedia.com slash deals is where you find that. Deals by listeners for listeners. And don't forget, of course, all three of our signature soaps are still available from Hero Soap Company. Timberline and Old West from yours truly, or Oat plus Almond from Blonde, or try all three, or any other of Hero Soap's fantastic offerings. Promo code MCLISTENER. For 10% off everything from our friends at Hero Soap Company as well. MattChristensenMedia.com slash deals for more information. All right, just a couple housekeeping items. We'll get right to the birth story. Uh, gay football championship is next week. So we're live after the Super Bowl. It'll delay the show by about an hour. So I wish they really called it that. <laughs> Are you having your gay football championship party tonight? Yeah. yeah. Well, I I don't know. I I don't have one planned this year. I know you're asking rhetorically, but I don't I don't have mine planned. I, I that one guy from uh, Senator Cardin's staff is available. I think he can come over if you're looking for a guest. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it'll be about 10 p.m. Eastern next week. Uh, after the after the game is concluded, we'll go live. Uh, I'm told that the much maligned Discord server depends on who you ask, I guess. But the Discord server has received a revival. And uh, recall, we used the the show Discord server for the old call in show and the Discord server kind of grew into a community of its own. And then after the call in show ended in November, those who were still active on the server asked me if they could keep it. And since I have no interest in managing it, I said, sure. And I turned the keys over. So if you would like to give the Discord server a chance, perhaps a new chance. It's now 80 percent feds instead of the normal 20 percent. Maybe. Yeah. It is under new management. I don't know if it's Fed management or not. I don't think it is. But it is. Um, one feature I'm told that's been added that the server managers are interested in promoting as well. It's um, 
they have their own movie review channel in there. So you can go in there and, and contribute to the movie review discussion and express how much hatred you have for my movie opinion, maybe even Blonde's movie opinion. I don't know. But if you want to share that uh, disapproval with other listeners of the show, that's one avenue to do it. Of course, it's a place to, to make friends with fellow listeners as well. Uh, again, under new management and oversight linked in the description, if you'd like to check it out and on the community page uh, of my website as well. Uh, one programming note too: uh, on Thursday, the Supreme Court will hear arguments in the Trump ballot disqualification case from Colorado. On my Wednesday show, I interviewed Lawrence Lessig, who is a Harvard law professor on the topic and what to expect from the Supreme Court and their forthcoming decision thought it was a great conversation. So if you'd like a little Supreme Court insight before they hear the case this week, uh, you can head on over to the website. Once again, mattchristensenmedia.com. Look for the Matt Christensen Hour, or you can check it out on Tenet Media's YouTube and Rumble channels. Wow, Harvard well. Law Professor, you are truly credible. Either that or Harvard's credibility has gone into the toilet. Oh, one, right. One of the two. Okay. There have been um, some news stories to that effect. A little bit recently. of this. A little bit no, of that. I, he he okay. was really cool. Um, he hates Trump. Things have been touch and go since David Hogg. I will say. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was the whole Claudine Gay thing too, but uh, that's right. Yeah. But no, I mean, it, uh, he hates Trump, but but he is a guy who values honesty and legal interpretation, and and not breaking the rules in pursuit of what he may want politically. So it was a really cool conversation. One that's rare. Uh, just that I suppose that someone was willing to cross political viewpoint to talk to me a little bit. I feel like I got a, a Harvard law lecture for free for a half hour, which was really nice. Um, at once upon a time, that was a, a very prestigious thing in this country. And I like to think That's at true. least from him, uh, it still is cool thing about him too. Um, he, what he clerked for Scalia back in the day. Really? Yeah. So he gave me a little insight on not just Scalia, but the inner workings of the court, which was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Um, if you cool. want a spoiler alert on that. A lot of the justices don't write their own opinions. The clerks write them for them. No. I am kind of surprised to learn <laughs> that, but not in Scalia's case. Scalia was the guy at his computer himself writing excellent opinions, uh, at least excellently entertaining, even if you don't agree with Scalia. They were they were one of a kind. And so he's until he got that. murdered. I didn't ask him that. I didn't want to I only had a half hour. I didn't want to go didn't want to go. I really anything. dropped the ball. You didn't yeah, start with did Scalia get murdered? Yeah. Why was there a pillow over his face, dude? He's well, like, hey, I don't know. I'm just a professor. Speaking of murder, I left a spot in the notes for your baby story. I didn't know if you <laughs> wanted to put any notes. So you put one note in there. Are you going to disclose yeah. what that note says? Or oh, it, just, it says it says R.I.P. Badge. That's all I. All right. <laughs> that's all I put in there. I mean, what I don't need to like write to down my birth story. It's indelibly About burned. What did Christine Blasey say? Me? Calm down, Miss Blossy Ford. The <laughs> devil in said. the hippocampus is uh, uh, <laughs> Kavanaugh, basically, but not really raping me. Was, yeah, yeah, that's that's how that's how women's births are. Anyway, you guys may have noticed because I was complaining constantly, but I was in something called prodromal labor for about eight weeks before I gave birth. What that means is that I was having um, practice contractions. They were not Braxton Hicks contractions. And sometimes they were really, really regular. So like there were a few times that I went into L and D one time at like 34 weeks where I was straight up having contractions every four minutes, just consistently for like three hours. They weren't super painful, but I, I just repeatedly thought I was going into labor. It was so frustrating. It was so frustrating. And I did not think that I was going to make it to, to term, let alone 40 weeks. So the night of my, my baby's um, due date, actually, I started having contractions where I was like, ooh, these feel different. They really, really hurt. So I decided to take a nap. Um, and then I went to L&D. I, I uh, left my husband with the baby. And they were like, all right, you're three centimeters dilated. I'm like, okay, that's pretty good. So I got into the bath and I, um, my husband was at home and everything like that. And I texted him. I'm like, I don't know. Come, don't come. I don't, I don't, whatever. I'm just going to labor in the bathroom. But you while. didn't ban him. I thought that was the plan. No, I mean, he came, but he was just useless. Just totally useless. <laughs> okay. I, I, mean, I thought he was going to be banished from the delivery room, but that was its own separate conversation. I, I, he, I, I, in future, I will barely remember him being there. He was like, at one point he was like, there, there. 
And that was that was just it. It was like he was not even there. Now, did he do the double pat? Because that's the sign of a good man. I identify with his behavior here. He, yeah, he like pats me on the head. Yes. There, there. Yes. Like this, you know. But my midwife was, you know, super cool. Everybody did a really great job. Anyway, so she came in um, after I had been laboring for I don't know, like a, like a few hours or whatever. I did get an epidural. Everybody can fuck off. It was awesome. I regret. It. Except it didn't work in like in like a two inch space in around my right uterus. And so it was the weirdest thing because you can't feel your legs or anything. But then I was having just like mind bogglingly bad p- pain just in this one tiny area. Um, so this hot anesthesiologist came and tried to tried to figure it out for me. Anyways, app and then uh, she woke me up and she's like, it's time to push. And then three pushes later, that's it. Three pushes. I delivered my daughter, Annalise. Um, she was almost nine pounds. Did you uh, have any doubt that you were going to go the epidural route? I assume you went in knowing that's what you were going to do. No, yeah. this, this sounds really <clears throat> similar to, to my wife's experience, too. And what we yeah, just had Yeah, because that in second December. baby, it's like your, your cavernous vagina just like shoots out. Hey, your speak baby. for your own. Whatever. I, I don't, I couldn't even believe it. Like I, I pushed once and I was like, I'm going to be pushing for hours. And she was like, I see the head. Just keep, just push two more times. The baby will be out. I was like, are you serious? Yeah. I couldn't believe it, it too. We, we were still watching the Vikings game when it happened. I'm like, I, I thought this was going to be hours. Yeah, yeah. It was just crazy. Um, and my baby was almost nine pounds. And, uh, she said the placenta was probably about nine pounds. <laughs> and then, uh, I had about nine pounds of amniotic fluid in there too. So, Instantly, I lost almost 30 pounds um, of fluid. I saw them take the bag away. I was like, it was so shocking. And because of that, I did have um, a postpartum hemorrhage, which was not that big of a deal. I didn't have to get a blood transfusion, but I am pretty anemic and feel like shit. Hmm. shit, Anyway, baby's healthy. I'm healthy. Everything's fine. Which is great news. And congratulations again. And I see in the photos that you share, there's one sibling photo. Do you have anything to share on the sibling experience? Oh yeah. I mean, she's, she's happy about it, but keeps trying to murder her. So I'm a little bit worried about it. Like, like she'll like try to put a pillow on her and stuff. I'm like, <laughs> I like, uh, no, you need to, um, not murder your sister. Do you, yeah. I need to heat up breast milk. My parents just asked me, I, I don't remember how to parent a newborn. I don't think so. That's, that's, that's your call, I, I guess. Uh, I don't I'm, know. Um, I'm, I'm curious about that, too, because with uh, with two boys, it's like older brother is pretty much apathetic to younger brother. And I'm I'm, I'm yeah. wondering if that's a boy thing or not. But no, you're she's describing like really something maternal, similar. but she's like superficially maternal. Like she'll be like, oh, I love the baby. And then she'll like do something super violent to the baby. I'm like, what, what are you doing? Like, you can't, you know, she sounds you can't scheming like baby. mom, you know, it's good image. <laughs> I know. Anyway, yeah. it was, it was a super awesome, easy. It was just so easy. It was did they try so to easy. pull any discharge tricks like they did to us? No, they good. Didn't, they didn't pull any. It was just, they got me out of there at 24 hours. Every, every person I interacted with, it was like a fucking dream. It was just amazing. Hmm. Um, I found a new pediatrician around here that I love. He was talking to me about how SIDS isn't real and that co-sleeping is fine. And I was like, I like you. you talk Nobody to... got on my case about vaccines. I They didn't uh, even them... try to sell the new RSV therapeutic injection. No one said anything to me about that. Wow. They, um, they didn't say anything to me about not getting hep B. I got the vitamin K with no preservative that had to be specially ordered. And that was like a super easy thing. It was just like a dream birth experience hmm. for me. The hemorrhage, not so great. Like I have a splitting headache right, headache right now from the anemia. If it was so good um, that they could not even break blonde's neuroticism, this must have been a hell of a delivery. I'm, congratulations to this hospital. I can tell, I could tell that every, it was like all hands on deck trying to make me like not freak out about every little thing, you know, because it's in my chart. Just OCD is just like on every page of my chart. It um, just says this bitch cray. <laughs> I know. Yeah. So like anything that seemed like it was going wrong, they would like approach it really gently with me. Like I had a little problem with the epidural and then the baby had to have CPAP for a few minutes after because she had some fluid in her lungs. 
but they were just chill and it was just routine. Nobody was, was giving me any vibes that anything was going terribly wrong. It was, it was just amazing. And I'm so glad I don't have to have any more children. I'm just, I'm never doing this again. Check back in a year or two's time. Nope. Place your bets now. Could we get uh, some kind of, some kind of Do you of have a picture of her up? I can't see. Um, I can right now. Uh, I have it just playing independent of what you can see in the share. It's just a oh, slideshow okay. of the stuff that you, that you sent me. I just copy and paste it. Emmeline. She looks so much like Emmeline. Like I, I'm looking at old pictures of Emmeline. I'm like, nobody can tell me this is not the same baby. Uh, I don't, I, well, I don't have the Emmeline photo in there, so it'd be hard to, I, I saw it personally, but the I audience, it to you, right? Yeah, it, yeah. It's like, it's like, that's, this is the same kid. Yeah. Did that it happened when you had a son, a second kid where you were like having a hard time intellectually understanding that this is a different child. Uh, well, I think from certain angles, our two sons look pretty similar. It's been disguised by the fact that our two year old has Calvin and Hobbes style, bushy blonde hair. Which That's is very true. appropriate for his name, and his younger and his brother, you know, again looks like a weird Eskimo of some kind. He's the, he has the thickest black hair I've ever seen on a baby. So dis- his head's smaller too, right? He doesn't have the freak head, so they don't look alike by virtue of two competing giant hair bushes. But uh, but when you see their face, especially like side profile face, then they look pretty similar. Man, anyway, it's just been a dream. She's just. She's super cool. She's just eating. She's getting three ounces a day. She's already back yeah. to her birth weight. I did. Yeah, I didn't know that. I must have forgotten that the first time. I forgot that babies lose weight and then come back up. I that was refreshed in my mind this last time around. But that's good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. OK, well, all good news and uh, congratulations to you and your family once again. And I'm sure we'll be revisiting the topic as the night goes on. But thank you. Do you guys see how, how my nose is already down like? Let's, I think like 20%. Have they, uh, what, what's the tool that they use to make that measurement? It's like some kind of calipers or should I get some, some kind of calipers? I don't know. Like nose measuring tongs. I don't know what the term would be. Uh, okay. I mentioned Fanny Willis has admitted at least a piece of the puzzle. And this comes after weeks of squirming and thinking up those excuses and explanations yeah. that really haven't what do you mean excuses much. all she said was you racist yeah cracker that's pretty much it she told that to a black church and she hasn't said much publicly beyond that but fulton county district attorney fanny willis in georgia has now admitted in court that at least the primary suspicion is true now they're saying it's not evidence of anything corrupt or anything necessarily wrong but they are uh, fanny willis is admitting that she is involved or has been involved in a sexual relationship with the personal injury lawyer she inexplicably hired as outside counsel to prosecute the Trump racketeering case, despite, again, no prior experience prosecute, uh, prosecuting a single felony case. This guy is completely unqualified, but she <laughs> hired him because, even though it's not because they had a sexual relationship, it has nothing to do with that. She does still dispute the claims of corruption against her. She calls those claims meritless and salacious. <laughs> recall, of course, the accusation isn't just infidelity since Wade at least was a married man, though he reached a divorce settlement this week as well. The accusation is that Wade used the near million dollars in public money that he's received through this hiring, at least in part to buy vacations and other personal perks for Fannie Willis. Willis kind of also. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, well. It's it's one of those because of course stories, but uh, yeah. Willis also says there's no reason to believe that her involvement with Wade has prejudiced the case. Okay, the filing contains a sworn affidavit from Nathan Wade, and he insists that uh, they had no personal relationship prior to or at the time he was appointed to this particular job, which is awfully hard to believe. But that's what he's saying. Wade also claims that he and Willis split travel costs equally. Providing um, he provided some receipts for travel that that show Willis paid for Wade sometimes. But that, of course, doesn't mean that the that he didn't buy her personal gifts with trips that they took together. Or on trips that they took together for personal reasons. So it it just means that she may have also bought him gifts along the way. If both benefited from public money and spent and spent the money on personal nonsense, we still have a corruption problem here, even even if they went Dutch. Even if it was 50 50. 
This court filing uh, Friday comes in response to the motion from Trump co-defendant Michael Roman to disqualify Willis and Wade from prosecuting the case and to dismiss the charges. Roman's lawyer, uh, Roman's lawyer immediately filed a response to urge the judge to move forward with an evidentiary hearing in the matter. That was actually previously scheduled. It's it's set for February 15th. That's a week from Thursday. It does remain possible that Willis and Wade themselves will be testified or will be subpoenaed to testify rather at that hearing. Uh, that was reported by CNN last week, but as far as I'm aware, that actually has not officially happened yet. They said it was coming, but I haven't seen confirmation that it's happened. It's also possible that the judge could agree with Willis and Wade and, uh, and their request in this filing and just cancel that hearing outright and move forward with, uh, with the trial. But the more that comes out, the more suspicious this looks. So I will certainly be watching if uh, if they actually get Fannie Willis and or Nathan Wade to take the stand, which, again, those hearings will be live streamed. That is must see. <laughs> I will be tuning in. All right. In other uh, Trump prosecution news, they've now delayed the January 6th case. This is the Jack Smith special counsel case that was supposed to start in March, but that's not happening now. Yeah. So you guys remember this this case. um, Special counsel Jack Smith and Judge Chutkin, Tanya Chutkin. I feel like you can't trust a female judge. Uh, it has motions that are pending on appeal. Um, it sounds like everybody kind of expected this to happen. So there's this claim of presidential immunity, um, and Jack Smith really wanted to push this through. He was unable to, and it went to a lower court. And now it sounds like it's just going to be delayed. Uh, when do you think this is going to happen? Well, it's it's actually looking like the best bet is that none of these trials happen before the election. And of course, if yes, that's the yeah. case and Trump wins, there will presumably be a move to pardon himself and erase those federal trials. He can't of do that for course. Georgia. But yeah, yeah if, 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 if this Jack Smith case, and then we also have the uh, Mar-a-Lago classified documents case, if those trials don't start before November and then he's elected, bye bye to those trials. But but can, why did this judge? I mean, she must be ideologically motivated because why on earth would she um, deny Trump's motion? It's obvious that he had immunity and that it was going to go to another court. Like, oh, why, why would she um, even bother? Well, this this case, this is the one that Jack Smith uh, asked the Supreme Court to handle mm -hmm. to expedite. Yeah. And they said, no, we're not going to expedite it. So there's yeah, still this whole sure. question of. Yeah, part of Trump's defense is whether he had presidential immunity uh, that would protect him from his actions taken leading up to and on January 6th. Right. But my question right. is, how how could anybody even argue that he didn't? Oh, uh, well, the the scope, I, I'm not keen on all the details, but the scope and what is the scope of presidential immunity would be would be the question. Like, is it absolute immunity while president and the correct way to handle a president committing a crime is impeachment? I, w I would tend to agree with that understanding. But the question is, what about instances like this where a president is he, he commits a crime, air quotes, that's what they're accusing him of right up against the end of his term. He was he was impeached, but acquitted in the Senate. If, if say, he committed a much more serious crime, like he killed a person, he actually did the Fifth Avenue shooting that he referenced that one time, whatever the quote was. Would would absolute presidential immunity mean he can't be prosecuted for such a crime? It's mm. those sorts of questions. Don't quote me on it because I haven't read all the specifics of this. But yeah, it, as in if you assume that presidential immunity is not absolute, there are questions to answer here about what he is and is not protected from in in this in in this prosecution or others. OK, so we just expect to see some sort of development after the election is what you're saying. Oh, as far as like how these trials are going to proceed? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, it's highly unlikely that these are going to happen before election date. So Fannie Willis, who knows what's going on there? I mean, that whole thing could be derailed by her lover boy. Mm -hmm. Jack Smith now delayed, as you just mentioned. The Mar-a-Lago documents uh, case, that judge is just taking her time. That trial is scheduled for May, but, but the pretrial pace here has been slower than expected. People are expecting that to be delayed. And then yeah. you have the New York Stormy Daniels case, which is the weakest case of them all. It relies on that untested legal theory that uh, because Trump has a, what would be a misdemeanor charge for falsifying business records that they're sort of shoehorning into a felony because they're saying it was a, a, a federal campaign finance felony that was never prosecuted anyway. 
Uh, that one's set, scheduled for March 25th, but that's ju- that judge previously said that he might move the date to let Trump's federal trials go first. But if the federal trials are delayed, then the New York one, if the judge sticks to that, would also be delayed. Hmm. And you don't have. Yeah, you don't you don't have any of these happening before the election. So it's tough to see it happening, uh, which I'm surprised by because it seemed like all of these were were timed for that purpose. And I'm not saying they weren't. It's just to the extent they were sort of simultaneous and seem strategically timed to meddle with the election, kind of a bad job by the meddlers. They should have allowed more time ahead of time, I guess. Uh, I mentioned at the top of the show, because what what excuses am I going to find to say butt sex? Okay, I, I have to do it. This guy's also not going to trial. The uh, The Senate butt sex guy and whoever his butt sex friend is, not going to trial. The dude who filmed himself having gay butt sex in that Senate hearing room back in December. U.S. Capitol Police have concluded their investigation into the incident involving former staffer for Senator Ben Cardin, Aiden Maisie Chorapsky. That uh, incident, of course, being the video recorded butt sex in the heart Senate office building. Previous reports said the charges in this case could range from trespassing to obscenity violations. But now Capitol Police say they have found, quote, no evidence of a crime from the statement from Capitol Police, quote, for now, we are closing the investigation into the facts and circumstances surrounding a sex video. That's awfully generic. They should use more specific terminology. They really should. Yeah. What kind of sex? (laughs) Uh, A sex video that was recorded inside the Hart Senate office building on the morning of Wednesday, December 13th. That was in the morning. For some reason, that that makes it seem even more offensive. Yeah. You don't defile the morning with that activity. Okay. The morning is a it's an it's a holy time of day. It's the start of a new day. Treat it with respect. (laughs) Keep it at night only. I don't know. Uh, Okay. Although the hearing room was not open to the public at the time, the congressional staffer involved had access to the room. The Capitol Police further clarified that the two individuals in question did not cooperate with the investigation and that the former staffer exercised his Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. So put your feet on Pelosi's desk four years in prison. At least that was the sentence. Walk around unauthorized in the Senate chambers in a. Interesting costume like Q Shaman. Three and a half year sentence. No, he served a little <laughs> less. But Have butt sex oh, all no. over Senate property totally after fine. hours when it's closed, or I guess in the early morning hours when it's closed. No harm, no foul, nothing to see here. So you know what this means. Next January 6th, when it's the real January 6th, if you guys want immunity, you must have butt sex in those buildings and you will not be prosecuted. You got to take one for the team. You got to take yeah. one for the second revolution in this country. I find this somewhat surprising. I've got to say, I thought something was going to happen. Uh, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I have a hard time believing. I mean, come on. It's a simple trespass seems appropriate. Even if you don't yeah. want to go after the sex angle. Yeah. Simple trespass, especially given the way January 6th was treated. Okay. Well, I wonder what job that kid will get next. Uh, please don't Google his name, prospective employers of the future. Although uh, last we checked in on him, remember he was uh, talking about how the Baltimore hobos were were hot. Now he's the hobo homo. Remember, <laughs> that's it. he's going to be homeless, servicing the Baltimore bums and dodging bullets. <laughs> you know what he can make use of is um. Remember that guy who got shot. He did, he set up those no shoot zones, yeah. but then yeah, he yeah, got yeah. shot. Yeah, he got shot. Yeah. He could just, just go to the no shoot zones and service the hobos there. All right. Um, it's, it's very difficult to understand Nikki Haley's continued campaign. She lost Iowa. She lost New Hampshire. And that was despite using pretty much all of her campaign uh, campaign resources there. And she had Democrats and left wing independents turning out to vote for her. She's still 30 points behind Donald Trump. In her home state of South Carolina and that primary coming up at the end of the month. And she appears content to get completely destroyed in her home state and suffer that embarrassment. And the question is why? Another question is, who who is she appealing to? 
Because she has many, many fans. What are you talking about? She doesn't appear interested in courting Republican voters. When you were out last week, we were talking to uh, uh, Frank and I were talking about E. Jean Carroll had that $83 million defamation. The uh, rape is sexy lady. Right. Their $83 million defamation verdict against Trump. Nikki Haley tweeted out dunking on Trump about how Donald Trump's legal problems are a distraction from the real issues. Uh, apparently blaming him for the distraction. Uh, as though she's not going to be hit with similar distractions the second she became the nominee, which will, which will never happen. She said on the meet the press last weekend that the jury got the decision right based on the evidence of which there is none. There, there is actually no evidence other than the claim of Eugene Carroll herself. So is, is Nikki Haley betting on Trump just getting removed from the race? If so, does Nikki Haley know something that's kind of, so that's what I'm curious about. Or is she just a She's cringe She's so factor? unpopular. There's just no way they'd be cluing her in. I don't, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I couldn't tell you why. If there was some pre-planned plot to remove Trump and they know it's going to happen, why she would be the pick to be like the, the Republican chosen candidate. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it's it's some tinfoil that needs a few more links. I'll have to work on it. But it, her running just doesn't make any sense on its face. And she appears to be just a cringe factory. These aren't yeah. mutually exclusive things, of course. Uh, she could be sitting, waiting and hoping for Donald Trump to get disqualified while also just being a cringe queen. You can do both of those things. Now, I've, I, I and we have been discussing for weeks and months, Nikki Haley supporters aren't real. They're a hoax. <laughs> It really are. It appears yeah. Nikki Haley is hoaxing support. <laughs> On Thursday, she tweeted messages of support that she supposedly received. One is a computer generated note that's supposed to look handwritten. I'm not saying it's fake for that reason. Clearly, she's not trying to pass this off as handwritten. It's just stylistic. But it says, I'm an independent and I voted for the best candidate in every election cycle. And this year it's Nikki. And this is supposedly from Mary A, who loves Nikki. Now, the second one is the truly bizarre one. It's a draft of an email, as in one that you write up but you haven't sent yet. And it's to Nikki Haley, and it's from Michael B. In part, he says, please do not give up your fight. This country needs you. I get that someone on a graphics team is making these. They're not supposed to be screenshots of like something she received. But why would you have your graphics guy make a draft email? A draft? That's so any sense. obvious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is the premise here that Michael B wrote this out? I was like, nah, it's total bullshit. I, I, I did. Or did what? Like screenshot it and sent the screen. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't even know. understand. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know who's, who's the graphics uh, person on Nikki Haley's campaign, but also maybe she did it herself. I hope that's the excuse. Cause it's that bad. And Nikki Haley is now ruining one of my favorite meme formats. Every fall you get the spirit Halloween costume memes. And you know, these, it's, 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 generic thing in the news. And then it's got, you know, characteristics, a, B and C it includes this a, B and C that's kind of the meme format. The key to the meme though, are there's a couple a, B and C have to be funny. Right. And, and crucially like spirit Halloween itself, it's a seasonal meme. Okay. You can't drop a spirit Halloween costume in February. You got to no. come up with some Valentine's day thing or something. But Nikki Haley shares this Donald Trump spirit Halloween costume meme. February Girl. 1st. And here are the funny characteristics of weakest general election candidate ever. You ready? $50 million in legal fees, terrible poll numbers, social media rants, and temper tantrums. As though Nikki Haley won't face similar legal fees the second that the machine targets her. And as though her polling numbers are better somehow. But... The cringe may have culminated with what was a surprise Nikki Haley Saturday Night Live appearance last night. Ugh. During the skit, Nikki Haley appeared as an audience member in a Trump town hall on CNN to ask questions. And it was exactly the sort of cringe you would think it would be. to debate Nikki Haley. Oh my God, it's her. The woman who was in charge of security on January 6th. It's Nancy Pelosi. For the 100th time, that is not Nancy Pelosi. 
It is Nikki Haley. You spent $50 million in your own legal fees. Do you need to borrow some money? Oh, Nikki, don't do this, Nikki. Nikki Haley, Joel Osment. Nikki Haley, Joel Osment, we call her. Six cents, remember that one? I see dead people. Yeah, that's what voters will say if they see you and Joe on the ballot. Oh, that, yeah, that's not very nice, Nikki. Ugh. Who's in the audience of SNL in 2024? People Ooh. who will never vote for. It's like, yeah, they're all cheering oh, for you. God. And none of these people will ever vote for you lady they're cheering for you solely on the basis that they hate your opponent as though that means anything at all Oof, yeah uh you know actually not that i found that to be like the funniest um that wasn't a funny skit obviously but that guy's trump impression itself i actually find to be pretty good even if the writing wasn't great there did you think the trump impression was okay God, the whole thing is painful I don't all right know. I'm trying to find something in it, but that's a waste of time. Uh, before we move into the migrant stuff, I got this was a, a big story in my state this week. And many of you emailed me about it. So thank you for the information. Uh, but I got to talk about the, the, what is alleged to be uh, uh, medical kidnapping, gender transition kidnapping by the state of Montana's Child Protective Services. We're going to get totally ripped. For we might. We like might. Uh, and I understand why people are are obviously scrutinizing this story closely. And I think you should, by the way. Yeah. I, I'm just going to say up front that I have I have some questions about this story. I, I'm not particularly convinced that it is as presented that the state of Montana took this kid, this 14-year-old girl from these parents because they refused to trans her. And that yes. is... Yes. That is the allegation. But uh, I'll give a, a quick summary for people who missed the story. There's a family from Glasgow, Montana. It's a small town in the northeast part of the state. They're claiming that Montana Child Protective Services, again, took their 14-year-old daughter. They're calling her Jennifer. That's not her real name, but that's what they're calling her. Took Jennifer into custody, transported her to Wyoming, and they're now giving custody of Jennifer to uh, her mom, her biological mom in Canada, because these parents, uh, Todd and Krista Kolstad, they say refuse to support a gender transition of their daughter. So Krista, who is Jennifer's stepmom, uh, not her real mom, her stepmom says the story began in August when they were told that their daughter expressed suicidal thoughts at school. Todd and Krista say their daughter was pulled from one district and placed in the other due to bullying and mental health issues. In August, uh, a caseworker from Montana or from Montana child Fa and family services rather came to their home to do an inspection. They allowed the inspector to look around the home. CFS interviewed Jennifer the 14 year old girl Jennifer claimed to have ingested toilet bowl cleaner and painkillers. Mm -hmm. Krista, the stepmom, said that was highly unlikely since Jennifer had access to neither of those things and showed no symptoms, but they agreed to take her to the hospital anyway. Blood work results showed Jennifer had uh, not consumed any toxic substances. Hospital paperwork from that visit says that Jennifer identifies as a male and wishes to be called Leo. So at some point during the hospital visit, this this teen girl must have told hospital staff that. Now, Krista and Todd say they objected to that name at the hospital. Krista says the hospital was socially transitioning their daughter, as in treating their daughter like a boy. Physical transitioning was banned in Montana at the time. It's currently in a court battle. We passed a law last year to, to ban surgeries, hormone replacements for kids. As, as far as I understand, it's caught up in court now, but... You couldn't do it at the at the time in August of last year. Jennifer was admitted to a hospital for suicidal ideation, placed on 24-hour watch. Krista said that the aide who was watching uh, her stepdaughter at the hospital would talk to her about gender transitions. Eventually, the state moved Jennifer to a Wyoming facility, uh, which they said the state said could provide her with better care. The parents tried to slow that move because they had some questions and they say that police came to their house with papers to take Jennifer out of their care. Uh, child and family services from the state of Montana said the reason was Todd and Krista were quote unable or refusing to provide medical care. Jennifer then went to Wyoming. They took her to Wyoming. She was not allowed to speak with her parents. Her parents say Jennifer returned to Montana in, uh, on September 25th and was placed in a youth home where she has remained since. In January, a, uh, a court here in Montana gave custody of Jennifer to Montana Child and Family Services. They are now 
planning to place her in the custody of her mother in Canada. Now, this story went viral on publication Monday. And by the end of the day, Governor Greg Gianforte, who you may remember from body slamming a, a Huffington Post reporter <laughs> right yeah. here in Bozeman back in 2017, uh, Governor Gianforte released a statement. I thought I had it in here, but uh, I guess I don't. Anyway, I have the statement in, in my notes. Uh, the statement um, said in part that he, as soon as he saw the news, he immediately had his lieutenant governor investigate. Her investigation concluded that Montana Child and Family Services acted lawfully. He had more detail than that, but that was a summary of the statement. Uh, now, the statement didn't explain exactly why it was lawful, but my understanding is that's because he can't or is not legally permitted to speak about specifics in a child custody case. Now, I suspect strongly there is more to this story than simply the family refusing to transition their daughter. Right. I'm not saying that 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 sort of thing was never encountered. You know, like I said, I've gone to uh, hospital, the hospital here in Bozeman with my kids and there's transgender propaganda stuff going on. So it's not inconceivable right. that they could have encountered such things at healthcare facilities in this state. I'm not saying that sort of thing never happened. What I'm saying is this is a state that is actually pretty, not pretty, very politically sane on this issue. As I mentioned, our legislature banned the practice of any physical transitioning last uh, legislative term last year. You had that crazy trans legislate, uh, member of the state legislature uh, who went who went crazy and made national news for a little while protesting the issue. And, and the governor signed that bill. The governor is not the sort of person who would... L- l- at least in my estimation, look at a situation, see that it's clearly just they refused to trans their daughter and we took custody of her. Right. right, right. If that was the case, personally, I'm confident that our governor would intervene and stop that sort of thing from happening. Indeed, if these parents are to be believed, this is the first time this has ever happened in the state of Montana. That's what they told Megan Kelly in her in her interview. I think on the right, we have this tendency to believe these medical kidnapping stories without appropriate scrutiny. And I have done it before on a few cases and then have come to discover that they truly were intervening because the child would die due to some sort of parental neglect. Uh, And it's happened like a few times. And so now I kind of approach these things a little bit more skeptically. In this case, I think that there's probably something that we're missing about the severity of the suicide attempt because the the parents were just like, she's engaged in attention seeking behavior before and she was a cutter. And they were like, well, it was just a scratch. And the girl that she told she was going to kill herself uh, to like, wasn't a very good friend. I was like, how is that even like the, like somebody that you don't know uh, that you're talking to and you're like, I'm suicidal. I'm going to try to kill myself. I tried to kill myself, whatever. And then they report it to the police. Like this other girl, it's like, she must've really taken taking her seriously right um so i understand that she didn't have any damage or ibuprofen or tylenol whatever she had taken in her system at the time but like i wonder if we're not hearing the entire story about um how serious she was with the suicide attempt and then it, that's why they're acting in the megan kelly interview which is 50 minutes long and i would encourage anybody who's interested in this story to check out if you want to hear and get all the, the full details at least what were being presented uh, they do go over some accusations that the father had has an alcohol abuse problem and that the stepmom is verbally abusive. Now, granted, I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not saying that, oh, this is for sure a justified taking by the state of Montana of this kid into custody. Right. Right. I All I'm saying is I have a very hard time believing this is genuinely the first time this state has ever just scooped a kid out of parents' custody for the, the sole purpose of transing that kid. And my other question about it is, they're they're claiming that the, the that uh, either the state of Montana or the medical system or a combination of both sent the kid to Wyoming because Wyoming doesn't have a law against transitioning kids physically, at least. But she was only in Wyoming for a month and then came back and is now in the state of Montana. They're saying that the facility is socially transitioning or that she participates in boys programs and things like that. But there's been no allegation of surgery, of hormone replacement, of any of that stuff. If the whole so point, why wouldn't they? Yeah. If the point of going to Wyoming was to get around that law, why didn't they get around that law? Why? Why was that never applied? Mm. So, you know, I, I again, not saying the taking is automatically justified. Not saying the state is one hundred percent correct. 
just saying I have a strong suspicion we are not getting all the details from these parents. Mm. But yeah, I know. if I'm wrong Maybe on that, are, I will 100% uh, retract my opinion. Yeah, but I watched, I know this is not evidence, but I, I watched the Megyn Kelly interview and I felt very strongly that these parents were creepy and weird and something was going on there. <laughs> Didn't we, you, the, the father, physiognomy like, report. you're a rapist, man. <laughs> I, it's not fair. Well, not that I, not that I place any definitive, um, not that I make any definitive conclusion on this basis, but I did notice that the stepmom was much more talkative than the biological father, which I found to be just a little curious. That's all. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're, that they're lying or something like that. I just, I don't know. I I, they might be. I found that to be odd. Uh, I found that to be. I found it to be odd that the guy who's raised this girl for her entire life was noticeably quiet or more quiet than the woman who has brought in been brought into that girl's life after the fact. Mm-hmm. But again, if it comes out that I'm completely wrong on this, and they can show me, uh, I'll eat crow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll come. I, and I don't blame. To be clear, I, I'm not making these statements to like tell anybody that they're wrong or something if there's a great place for a high level of scrutiny it's when the state takes kids from parental custody i'm no fan of that by default don't get me wrong i just uh this is like a smell test thing to me man this is uh, when when people say i can't believe this is happening in montana yeah kind of is that, it happening in montana yeah that's why i'm very the, our governor our state legislators our attorney general these are people who if if they're looking at this case and they're seeing all the details they're they're a plus on pretty much everything else i just have a hard time believing that they're seeing it and going oh nope uh, it's very important that this child is trans i think they're looking at this and they're seeing information that's not necessarily public and they're saying yeah that's kind of bad i just can't tell the public about that that's my guess yeah i mean wouldn't they be um saying something if they could I would assume, I assume the governor is not eager to go out and release a statement that's sort of ambiguous and wishy-washy about something that it's, it's politically unpopular. Obviously, if this is as cut and dry as it's being presented, the governor would go out and he would want to do the right thing because it's something he talks about all the time and it's a bill that he signed, but it would also be very politically popular. There's nothing politically popular about releasing an ambiguous statement. That's like, I looked at it and it's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it appears to be legal. Right. That that's a it's politically damaging to him. So I would assume there's a reason for it. But anyway, just want to talk that talk about that a little bit because uh you know, as I mentioned, a lot of people were sending that my way. And I appreciate that. And um if people have more information on it or as it develops, definitely can keep me uh in the loop because I wanna follow that story, of course. It um it's important for its own sake, but it's important uh legally speaking for my family and my state. All right, uh, man, we're already close to the top of the hour, but well, what would you rather do? Would you rather take an early super chat break or should we get into the migrant story a little bit? Let's get into the migrant story a little bit. Let All me right. check on the baby. Okay. Well, I think we're only a day or two removed <laughs> to the, <laughs> until we get to the conclusion of this story, which is Joe Biden actually wrapping a medal around, around the neck of the double middle finger migrant uh, yeah, really. Guy, as and then having depicted. butt sex with him in the Senate. <laughs> I, the, the two stories could collide. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> all right. By now, everybody pretty much knows like the general facts of this Times Square attack. But the plot has thickened since then. But how, how did this all start? So this two NYPD officers, um, what well, was it? NYPD officer and a lieutenant tell these migrants. They're like, all right, move it along. OK, it's 830 p.m. on Saturday. And then a fight breaks out. I shouldn't even say a fight breaks out. They straight up get attacked by by these migrants. At first it's one. And then like a bunch of them just kind of come out of nowhere, like cockroaches, like cucaracha. Um, And then they're just like wailing on these cops. So they're asylum seekers from Venezuela beating the shit out of these cops. Four of them were arrested, processed, cut loose without bail. A fifth in custody Wednesday afternoon. And three more are just gone, totally gone. Uh, so it looks like one person may face some, some kind of repercussion from this. Wow. One of these guys was arrested a few weeks ago for biting somebody when he was uh, shoplifting from Nordstrom. He did the old Mike Tyson, huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's the uh, the beating clip, if you missed it. 
A group of migrants in New York City are arrested after attacking NYPD officers in Times Square. Four are already released without bail. Two officers were trying to break up a rowdy crowd near a migrant shelter on 42nd Street. While arresting one of the men, the other said, hey, I'm not going to just sit there. I'll start kicking. I'll stop punching the officers. After all, I don't belong in this country anyway. Okay. Uh, then you get all the outraged politicians like Kathy Hochul. Who's who's now saying she wants these people deported? Uh, I, I noticed that you're particularly mad when the people who are beat up or victimized are cops, which don't get me wrong. I am not arguing that they should be victimized. This attack has no place in our country and should be penalized severely, especially on the basis that these people have no legal business being here for multiple reasons. But I uh, I have to express a certain frustration when it is agents of the state who are attacked and suddenly you care so much. I know. Fancy that. Yeah, really. What about all the people getting murdered, raped, robbed, and everybody's like, well, it's part and parcel of whatever the fuck. And then it's like cops. Everybody's like, whoa, whoa. That there was something kind of satisfying about this. I, I don't I, know what to say. I know like back the blue and everything like that, but like part of me, part of my libertarian, my former libertarian brain that gets a visceral satisfaction from watching a cop get the shit kicked out of him. Isn't that messed up? Uh, yeah, I would agree. I, you probably should not take joy in this because this is, well, no, let me, no. How do I want to phrase this? I don't know, buddy. Laughing at this is the <laughs> only way I can process it because as we're going to get to, I mean, th this is such a, a metaphorically important <laughs> moment in the collapse of our country. <laughs> it really is. So, but it does bother me that people care now. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, for police who abuse their powers and certainly for feds whose the very existence of many of their powers is in fact an abuse itself. Yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, I understand the sentiment where you feel like there's been quite a lot of abuses over the last few years. Uh, and there have been with Corona tyranny and a bunch of other nonsense, but, um, allow me to contend that this is not the way, you know, if, if we want to, um, correct any excesses in the police force migrant beatings are not the way we no, should but if find this is a lay person would this even have created a ripple in the news cycle no i don't think so no i, I don't the, think so either yeah. the, the, but that's part of the metaphor the fact that it took place in an, such an iconic american site times square against new york city's finest like the the NYPD has got to be what it's probably the biggest police department. Maybe LAPD is bigger. I don't know. As don't far know, as police know, forces yeah. in the U S it's about as major as it gets. Anyway, then comes the moment they, they they're arrested. They head on down to wh wherever they went, the courthouse, I guess, or police station, whatever it was. They're released on bail. They are allowed to just walk free. And as they are with cameras, media cameras in their faces, they're just flipping the double birds. Just into Fox News now, NYPD making two more arrests, illegal immigrants and that attack on officers. Those suspects also allegedly stole an officer's cell phone. Well, that'll help them track you down. So a fifth illegal immigrant accused of attacking two New York City police officers over the weekend showed no remorse or regret. He was seen, as you can see, giving his two middle fingers to the cameras moments after being released without Fail. Now, unbelievably, they have not learned their lesson because it appears the crime continues, or at least the fraud. Uh, on Friday, Fox News reports that four of the men arrested and released uh, for this Times Square cop beating have fled to California on a bus. <laughs> but the story is even better than that. They schemed to get their tickets paid for by the taxpayer. Because New York City is so crowded with migrants, the city's Office of Emergency Management has been supplying travel vouchers to migrants who approach participating nonprofit groups to ask for help leaving. So these suspects are believed to have swapped immigration numbers with other people at the shelter and then used the stolen identities to obtain the vouchers and the tickets with these fake names or fake immigrant IDs. This, according to law enforcement uh, sources, speaking with Fox News. The source says that a woman uh, at one of these participating churches, these nonprofits facilitating the travel, recognized the suspects' faces and flagged them, but apparently only after their departure. 
It also turns out they're not just wanted for beating cops' asses. They're wanted in a theft ring. Authorities now say six of the migrants who beat up the cops are believed to be part of a larger theft ring in which they used Apple Pay on stolen phones to buy things, including cars and pools. That was the language in the New York Post report here. I thought, cars, I understand, but what do you mean buy a pool? Well, according to a police source, they're stealing the phones. They're using Apple Pay on the phones, buying cars back in Ecuador and Venezuela and putting pools in their homes there. So I don't, what do you pay for an, Brilliant. an invoice from Brilliant. some contractor? He goes and builds you a pool, I guess. The money is going back and forth. This is why the larcenies are getting out of control. It's unbelievable what they're doing, said the source. Police believe the theft to be organized and gang related. Making it even more hilarious. Well, okay. It says this is the second paragraph of the story. In addition, immigration warrants have now been issued for several of those who fled, the guys who beat up the cops and are part of this theft ring. But then uh, you scroll down a little further and it says uh, police have an idea where these guys went. Again, I guess on the bus to California, but they can't pick them up unless they miss their court dates because they were released without bail. So there's no violation there, apparently. But if there's an immigration warrant out, like even if they're beating the cops ass matter has been settled because they're charged and released. If there's a new immigration warrant, which this reporting says, how come they can't pick them up on that? Maybe it, maybe that's a fed thing, I guess not a New York city police thing. I, I suppose I should, I should be outraged, but fundamentally I believe that we deserve what we get on this one. And I'm glad to see that it's somebody in position of authority that's uh, getting in instead of a, uh, the average American. So the, this is this is hilarious. Well, they what, both what did everybody We're expect? definitely all getting it. <laughs> oh, for sure. Uh, what did everybody expect? I, I do not believe that people did not see that this was the necessary uh, result of letting all these migrants well, to our country. It was they're, so st- they're still acting like that. We'll get. I want to get to a clip after the break here because it's a great one from CNN. But even after this, they kick the cops' asses. They're stealing people's phones to build pools at their Venezuelan homes and buy nice cars. It's still controversial in many left-wing circles to say these people should be deported. Anna Kasparian at the Young Turks is getting ripped right now for saying that. They beat up our cops. They flip off everyone on TV. They steal people's identity and then fraudulently obtain taxpayer-funded transportation across the country. Even that is not sufficient to say these people have no business in our country. And if you don't believe in deporting those guys, you don't believe in deporting anybody. But that's kind of the point. You you are saying the entire country has a right to come in or the entire world has a right to come in and rape our country. And if we're laying down for it in this way, I suppose there's kind of a, a point there. Yeah. That maybe we've surrendered to that. But that that really is the metaphor of this moment. I know in the grand scheme, the grand scheme of migrant crime, this is kind of a drop in the bucket. But this moment, again, of of coming into our country and breaking our laws, not just in the entry, but in this rampant theft scheme that they're engaging in, beating up our law enforcement at one of our country's most iconic sites, Times Square. And then they don't even have to break out of jail. Like if if they actually did some sort of Shawshank thing where they busted out of jail. Damn, those are some advanced criminal migrants. No, we, we just let them walk while they flip us off. And then they fleece us for a trip across across the country to go steal more and maybe beat up more people. They didn't just escape. We fund their escape, too. And it, it's just a completely defeated, conquered, bitch state of the country right now. I, I was, That's where we are, man. That's where we are. I was trying to think about this earlier. I'm writing in the, in the notes. This is like going to Mount Doom and teabagging Sauron in front of the orcs. Okay, He's not Sauron anymore. It's going to the Death Star and taking a shit right on Vader's mask. All the stormtroopers are like, well, I guess Vader's a big pussy. I guess that's over. (laughs) Our headquarters, Times Square, a a cultural headquarters, just got teabagged by these invaders. And we're just going to lay down for it. And that that's why, seriously, we're, we're, we're very close to the Biden metal image being a reality. We're like right there. And the meme will come true. But there's it's much time more. to go full clown pill. Don't you, don't you find any of this funny? You have to. Yeah. That, and that's what I mean. Like, I, I don't take joy. In, like, I'm not glad that this is happening. It's it's horrible. This is a, a complete mockery and failure of a country right now, at least in this particular way. But I don't know a way to process it other than to laugh at the absurdity. 
you have to because it's, it's just so freaking ridiculous, man. But totally. No. All right. There's more to say on the migrant stuff, but we definitely should take a break. Um, and I don't know if you need a break, obviously step out whenever you need to, but, uh, Yakko over on rumble, the left virtue signals about sanctuary cities, but uh, doesn't want migrants. They want a living wage, but they import those who work for less. They complain about crime while importing the third world WTF. Yeah. Well, if you're searching for uh, philosophical consistency, good luck. That's, that's <laughs> going to be a fruitless quest. Godspeed. Thanks for supporting the show. Addicted to drums says new baby fund. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Evil Zombie Toe, I'm currently at the border at Shelby Park. It's situated directly between two legal points of entry, which is partly why it's a key area. The rest is mostly for show. Customs and Border Patrol mostly avoids it. Yeah, maybe um, maybe there is some kind of show component to it. I've also read, though, that border crossings in Texas are, are down significantly as a result of this move. So I don't know. I don't know we'll who see. to believe. But in general, uh, good is what I say about what's going on with Governor Abbott in Texas. Um, over on Odyssey, <laughs> Mike Hawk, 420 Blazin. I mean, I can't even read this. It's just, it's a series of F, F word certain demographics and other demographics should be gassed. Congratulations, Blonde, on the birth of your beautiful baby girl. Thank it you. makes this cold heart of mine hate a little bit less. Oh, no. Well, that's, that's unfortunate. Not I, that's not I, I am not going to be niggardly. Thank you, sir. Uh, again, if you want to have the uncensored experience, Odyssey would be the, the place to go. Raja Mahan has no power there. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we're good on DLive. Thank you guys there. Let's get a couple on uh, YouTube and Tippy. We'll get back into it. Do you have them? Oh, sorry. Um, I don't know why. I just assumed you were going to do that. Mint says, congratulations to Blonde. Good to have you back. Yes, Ibot PN. Thank you for supporting the show. Very much appreciated. I got Holden next. We love you. You're very special. Why we can't trust feelings. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. That's Proverbs. Oh, she's asleep. Okay, I'm good. Um, <sighs> Thank you, Holden. That, that, that's true. Much appreciated. Deceitful above all things. Who can't understand the heart? Who? But, but for God. Um, Bill Biz, congrats to Blonde and the family on the birth of your baby girl. Want to mention the meal train up there, which sounds like a great sense of community. Blonde, <laughs> now just a few more to catch up with Ayla, or Isla. Um, wife with a purpose has eight children. Okay, I'm 36. I'm, I'm hanging it up. I'm, I'm not doing this again. Well, you had a pretty good run, even if you are, uh, even if this is the end of the child rearing. It is. I thought I was never going to have kids there for a hot minute. I don't really know why I thought that <laughs> nothing was wrong, but I just don't want to do this anymore. I love having kids I hate being pregnant. Um, so this is it with our, with our daughters. Das Pooch. If Matt truly wants his hit piece, you have Lana Loktev on as the guest co-host instead of a safer do like Frank and like you, would be cool too you get a midstream channel termination. I don't think he actually wants that. There is that. There's that consideration. But no, I don't I don't pick Frank because he's safe. I pick Frank because he's reliable and we work well together. And it's especially like in yeah. a situation He's funny too. In you know, it's one thing if we have a planned absence like when you went um on vacation in September, you can work around that a little bit, but uh in a situation like this too where you don't you know that Blonde's going to be out but you don't know what you don't day. know when. Yeah. And I kind of got to ask someone, could you be on call for like a month? It was more um, than a month because of the prodromal labor. So yeah. we had to be like, listen, from like 34 to 40 weeks, we had to be like, yeah. And he was great. You know? And there aren't a lot of people I can get that sort of commitment from. And Frank is, is one of those dudes. And, and yeah, you know, the thing is too, like um, the Sunday show, you know, it's, it's a, it's a long commitment. You know, if I want someone to sit in for like two and a half hours or in Frank's case, three and a half hours, cause that's what he does for me. That's a big ask, but you got to know that it's someone who you work well together with too. Cause if it's totally. someone I've never streamed with before and doesn't and really have a sense do? of how it works, yeah. it's going to be really weird. It's not going to work too well. So, uh, um, but I take your points one day. I will get to uh, the hit piece goal someday. 
Okay, now they're saying I need to come down. Shoot. Okay. Uh, we can do this in like eight minutes. All right, I'll just read a few more. I'll, I'll probably get okay. back into the news before you come back. Uh, unless there's, is there anything you definitely don't want to miss in the notes? I can save it for you. No, it's cool. All right. All right. Do what you gotta do. Sorry about this. All right. Eight minutes. All right. I'm going to proactively mute blonde's mic. So we don't accidentally hear any hot mic moments, but if I forget to unmute her mic, when she comes back, I'll need a reminder. So <laughs> to the production team in the chat, help me out. Uh, just a couple more here. We'll get back into, uh, the news. Laurel says I have moved to Missouri. My sister bought 80 acres to be the new family compound. A quarter of it is mine. Uh, the country where it is located or the County, sorry, the County where it is located has a population of under 9,000 for the entire County. So excited. Well, congratulations, Laurel. I'm really glad to hear it and uh, all the best to you and your family. And if I have bug out needs for the, um, the coming 1860s reenactment, <laughs> perhaps I will consider Missouri. And uh, all the best to you guys down there. Citizen seven. Congrats, Becky. Hope you and the, uh, and the new baby are doing well. I will be sure to forward that to her. Thank you, sir. Or ma'am. I guess I don't know, but I assume, sir. Moist farts. Great guest co-host as of late, Matt. Last week uh, with Frank, Ron, Ron Perlman this week. Come on. Looking forward to Lizzo or Patrick Ewing next week. Congratulations to Blonde for having her little one before the start of... Bl- Black History Month. Love you, faggots. You suck. Fuck you. Okay, I'll have to. You suck. Fuck you. I I, I will come back to these chats because I, I want to make sure that Blonde doesn't miss uh, the ones that are meant for her. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut that there and come back to these um, chats. I'll have to just circle back with you. Later in the stream. For now, we'll get back into the news and I'll talk a little bit more of these migrant topics. Uh, Starting with Boston, because it's not just New York City that is having these um, these migrant problems. Of course, I mean, this is happening in really all over the country now. It's not even just urban centers. Uh, You're seeing a lot of of this crime, migrant crime spread into suburbs, too. In this case, in Boston, it's not necessarily a crime angle. It's just a resource management angle. Uh, But this week, Massachusetts Governor Maura Healey announced that a rec center in the Roxbury neighborhood of Boston will be at least temporarily converted to a migrant shelter. The governor was tearful in making the announcement because, gosh darn it, illegal immigrant kids need swimming lessons, too. Here was the governor. Emotional, guys, okay? Because I'm committed to this. Little kids need to be able to breathe clean air. They need to be able to access swimming pools. They need to have lifeguards there who are going to teach them how to swim. And they need to have activities. I don't know what we're going to do for a couple, three months. I'll call universities. I'll call other places. The governor uh, made this announcement saying that she has no other choice. Because Logan Airport in Boston is full of migrants. Uh, The state shelter system has reached its limit. Apparently, she doesn't view the uh, the dump trucks with the scoops in Soylent Green as a viable choice. We'll get to that later in the show. But um, the plan is to make this rec center a migrant home until May 31st. And as far as I understand, that means uh, the various facilities and activities that are a part of this uh, particular rec center are closed to locals who normally use it. Many of whom were angry outside of the facility this week. One says he's a homeless man. The other is a mother of four. And this Fox News reporter spoke with a Democrat Boston City Council member who now says, uh, yeah, maybe sanctuary city policy was a mistake. Y'all give a fuck about the motherfuckers that was born and fucking raised here. Y'all raised the fucking rich so fucking high, can't afford to live here. But y'all gonna bring some other motherfuckers here? That doesn't fucking add up. It doesn't make no fucking sense. None. I'm fucking homeless. I work a full-time job, 40 hours, and can't pay to live here. How the fuck are y'all going to bring somebody else here? Why are you outraged? Because this place was, like you said, it's free. It was a place for our children. What about the people that are already here that don't have homes, that don't have jobs, that are sleeping on the street already? This is not the answer to help them. Now it's going to destroy our community more in 
mess our children up more. I, I know you're a Democrat, but do you think declaring cities as sanctuaries was a mistake in retrospect? Looking back, if our communities end up losing the services they need to live full lives, I think we may be questioning that. Will the hollow Democrat pandering to black people finally uh, evaporate? Will it finally expire? How bad will it have to get before Boston stops voting for Democrats in general or cynically? Maybe the plan is just to replace uh, black voters who formerly voted Democrat with new illegal immigrant voters. Once we um, once we move to give all the people who are already here a path to citizenship or whatever the resolution will be in the future. Now, how bad is it? Not just at the border, but the state of immigration in this country in general. Even Dr. Phil, the very polite, the very pleasant Dr. Phil has had enough. Dr. Phil is down at the border and he's even talking shit about Kamala Harris. According to the Department of Homeland Security, since President Biden took office, more than six million illegal immigrants have crossed Texas southern border in just three years. That's more than the population of 33 different states in this country. And what about our Vice President, Kamala Harris? Did you know she's our country's immigration czar? Guess how many times she's been to the border? Once. I don't know why that was so robotic. He's clearly reading a script there, but it just sounded really weird and forced. But that's not really the point. The point is, uh, you know, this is this is the sort of substance for a, a TV personality like Dr. Phil to be considering. That's how that's how bad it's getting. Uh, this is apparently for his new show, Dr. Phil Primetime. This after his Dr. Phil show ended its 21 year run last May. There's also uh, or there was a House vote this week uh, to advance articles of impeachment out of committee. Uh, against Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. This week, um, well, the, the House is expected to vote on it uh, potentially this week. Um, but the the two articles that were advanced out of the Homeland Security Committee, two articles of impeachment, uh, are willful and systemic refusal to comply with the law and a breach of public trust. Now, during the hearing considering these two articles of impeachment, Congressman Robert Garcia of California brought in this big graphic of what was supposed to mock Donald Trump's border vision and the rest of congressional Republicans border vision, but it actually makes it sound pretty awesome. So let's review the majority's border ideas that they've actually presented. Here they are. Donald Trump actually has said that he wants to build alligator moats along the border. That's one of his incredible ideas. Another idea that Donald Trump has promoted is he actually wants to electrify the border fence and maybe even put some spikes on the border. That's another Donald Trump and MAGA majority border idea. Another idea, which I'm not sure how, how well it would go, is he wants to actually bomb northern Mexico with missiles. That's another Trump idea. And finally, I think one of the ones that I think um, is the most grotesque is suggestions that instead we should maybe just shoot migrants in the legs as they cross the border. So once again, the Donald Trump and MAGA plan is alligator moats, bombing northern Mexico, shooting migrants in the legs, and electrifying the fence and putting spikes on them. That is the Donald Trump border plan. Sounds like a, uh, a junior high student council campaign speech or something so in conclusion and in summary alligators electrified fence shooting migrants in the lake okay <laughs> said with apparent uh I, I guess a total lack of understanding that that is actually quite appealing to many americans not just for its cartoonish qualities but in in opposition to what we currently have and, and the obvious question to ask the congressman here what exactly is your vision? Because the status quo, again, is guys entering our country and beating up our cops and flipping us off with impunity. That is more cartoonish than the alligators in the moat and the soldiers shooting the migrants in the legs and the electrified fence. What we're watching right now is the cartoon. And this guy's acting like it would be absurd to have alligator moats. Did you see that clip of the congressman where he was hold holding up Trump's plan? It's like you think that this is going to bring people to your side? This most, most Americans, maybe 
Maybe they look at that and think a little harsh, but most Americans are thinking something closer to that is better than migrants kicking our cops asses and flipping us off. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I, I, the thing is, if you ask the congressman, is, is that what you want? The, the, the status quo, I, I suspect he'd probably say yes. Um, there was one, uh, so a couple of super chats I wanted to bring to your attention. Uh, citizen seven said, congrats. I just want to make sure that you, you got that. Hope you and the baby are doing well. He says, uh, Laurel moved to, or bought a bunch of land in Missouri. I don't know if you caught that. I forget if that was before or after you left. So that's exciting for her. That's why I told the chat to, yes. Thank you guys for reminding me. Before uh, I was unmuted, I said all sorts of insightful yeah. and or racist things. It was very fun. Well, that's that's why I took the step of, of muting your feed because I just, you know, who knows what sort of hot mic you're going to get from the other room or something. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you guys for tipping us off to that. Appreciate it. And this one from Moist Farts. Great guest co-hosts uh, as of late, he says. Uh, <laughs> he had Frank last week. Ron Perlman this week. Looking forward to Lizzo or Patrick Ewing next week. It's a wide nose joke. Congratulations oh. to Blonde for having her little one before the start of Black History Month. Hey, I think it looks better. Also, Ron Perlman, super Jewish. Lizzo is a big fat black woman. Who's Patrick Ewing? Patrick Ewing is a former NBA center. I forget what position he played, but former NBA NBA player. Yeah. Oh, he said he, he said the M. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so I uh, the only other thing you missed that I th- I figured would be a blonde theme is that crying Massachusetts governor. Oh, we have to open the rec center to the migrants because there's no other way. Immigrants need swimming lessons too. Oh, yes. Boo hoo hoo. Well, you got here just in time for the exciting news that uh, I had this prepped earlier because uh, there. For weeks now, there's been this behind closed door negotiation in the Senate about what border bill we're going to get, which is preposterous because there's no bill necessary. The president has the legal authority to enforce the border today. He just chooses not to. This mockery of the asylum system where people just show up and say, "I, I fear to go back to my home country. And then they're given a court date and they're let into the country. That's something that we have not done, at least on this scale in the history of the country. That's a new thing that President Biden has implemented. Uh, and the, the law hasn't changed to do that. He could reverse that that policy tomorrow if he chose to. He just doesn't choose to. But we're going to act like a new bill is necessary for some reason. And um, and earlier today, Senator Kirsten Cinema, who is a part of the negotiation team, had some commentary on what to expect out of this bill on Face the Nation. But then just before live, it came out the Senate the Senate's uh, proposed migration bill is out. And lo and behold, it appears to be mostly just a, another giant spending bill. It's not like, no, seriously, enforce the law that's already on the books. It's it's the Emergency National Security Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2024. It's 370 pages. And of course, I have not read it prior to the show. It came out uh, just tonight. And and so I don't know what's in it. But Cinema did offer some uh, some pieces of the bill this morning before it was officially released. Mate, if Biden is going to support this and Chuck Schumer is going to bring this to a vote, they're saying he will on Wednesday. Maybe they will actually do away with this asylum farce that we've been having for the last few years. If this uh, was passed, it would end the practice of catch and release, which allows migrants without proper documents to be released in the United States as they their cases play out in court. Migrants would instead be taken into short term detention to be interviewed on whether they qualify for asylum. She said if they do not qualify for asylum, they will be sent back to their home country. Imagine such a thing. And then um, if they're a novel idea, right? Under this deal, uh, under this policy, if there are 5000 migrant encounters a day, I've seen different reporting on that number. But if there are 5000 encounters a day, the border just stops processing at that point. Um, And I've seen people worry about this number. They say the correct number is zero. Now, I agree the correct number of zero illegal crossing, the correct number of illegal crossings is zero. But when we see this 5,000 number here, what they're talking about is not necessarily people crossing the border. What they're talking about is encounters that under this proposal would then be processed through this interview situation. And if they're not asylum, if they're not valid asylum claims, then they'd be thrown out. So I just want to be clear on what that 5,000 number represents. I think it's been a little bit unfairly characterized as they're saying 5,000 people get to cross the border every day 
right, and then we shut down the border. That's not quite what they're proposing, at least as she was describing. Now, <laughs> does that mean that there aren't going to be thousands of people crossing through other means? Not even bothering to say, I fear to go back to my home country and just walking across the border where it's less uh, attended. Yeah, I mean, that's still a major problem, too. So obviously um, that's something that's going to persist. So this bill is out. Um, it's not at all clear that this has a path to to pass. Chuck Schumer, again, is saying he I, I, I already is going to bring it to a vote on Wednesday. Uh, but it's not clear that that it's going to pass in the House. Speaker Johnson says he hasn't even been briefed on it. At least that's what he said recently. I'm assuming if Democrats are on board or Chuck Schumer's on board that Joe Biden would sign it. But again, it's one of those things. Sign it for what? If it's a massive appropriations bill, then I assume the deal here is the deal here is, OK, I'll actually start enforcing the existing law a little bit in exchange for massive funding for projects A, B and C that are completely unrelated. Um, if Joe Biden really cared about Fixing the asylum system, he can do it tomorrow. He doesn't need this bill. So there's something else in it for them in this bill. I just, there I just don't always know why. is. You got to read it, 370 pages, comb through it. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, can well, we can we weaponize AI, AI to like give us the TLDR in this shit? There's got to be a way, but AI, you know, AI is um, ideologically compromised too. So I don't trust AI. But uh, there, on, on the topic of um, not necessarily uh, migration here, but it's crime related. And I thought this was hilarious. So I'll toss it in here. Uh, Gavin Newsom, California governor, of course, he told this hilarious story this week. On Wednesday, he was on a Zoom call forum. This was the most I'm not even being hyperbolic, the most out of touch I have ever seen a United States leader be of, of his domain like i could not even believe this it was shocking which is saying a lot for him because he's a champion of that uh but yeah gavin newsom's on this call i guess it's about some mental health proposition that he's supporting incidentally he described how he was recently in a checkout line at target where he saw someone stealing in plain sight who could imagine such a thing someone walking out of target with items and not paying for them and gavin said to the clerk hey why doesn't somebody stop that man And she apparently, this clerk, not realizing who he is, said, well, that's really the governor's policy. Uh, So we just don't bother stopping thieves. Check it out. The woman says, oh, he's just walking out. He didn't pay for that. I said, well, why are you stopping? She goes, oh, the governor. Swear to God, true story. On my mom's grave. The governor lowered the threshold. There's no there's no there's no accountability. I said, that's just not true. And I, she got, I said, we have the 10th toughest, $950, the 10th toughest in America. She didn't even know what I was talking about. By the way, it's the 10th toughest in America. So look it up. No one gives a damn about right. that. And I said, it's just not true. There's still stop. They said, well, we don't stop them because of the governor. And then she goes, she looks at me twice and then she freaks out. She calls everyone over, wants to take photos. I'm like, no, I'm not taking a photo. We're having a conversation. Where's your manager? How are you blaming the governor? And it was, you know, $380 later. And I was like, why am I spending $380? Everyone can walk the hell right out. I mean, even if that's true, is that true? Yeah, I did a little bit of fact checking. So I'll I'll clarify some of the points, but finish your thought. Yeah. Even if true, if it's not uh, being enforced broadly, then it doesn't really matter. Because the take home message is that not, nothing's going to happen to these people. They're, if, if they're being uh, convicted and reprimanded, then, like, who gives a shit? If that's yeah, and that, that's really exactly the point. Because, in fairness to the governor, um, this is not what's going on in California as far as what counts as felony theft. That's not a Gavin Newsom thing. Uh, that was Prop 47, which Californians voted for in 2014. Now, that law makes any theft under 950 bucks a misdemeanor. And he is right that that's actually. That's in line with, uh, you know, with most other states. As far as I'm, as far as I can tell, he's correct that that's the tenth lowest standard. We're talking about the distinction again. It doesn't. It's not to say that you can steal anything under nine hundred fifty bucks. It's that if you do, right. that's a misdemeanor offense. Anything over nine hundred fifty bucks is a felony offense. But yeah, your point is exactly right. The question is, what happens when you do that? Are you actually prosecuted? Are you actually put in jail? Do California DAs actually pursue these cases, these misdemeanor theft cases? Do they actually lock up repeat offenders? If not, and they and these criminals know that they won't be 
put in jail. They know that they can flip off the cameras like the guy in New York City. Then, yeah, if you know there are no consequences and that's a prosecutorial policy, again, under the governor's justice department in that state and the oversight of the attorney general who serves at the pleasure of the governor or the nomination of, at least I'm pretty sure in California, maybe the California AG is elected. I might be wrong about that. Someone can fact check me on that. But as far as law enforcement, the executive branch is generally in charge of that sort of thing. So if Gavin Newsom doesn't like DAs not prosecuting things that are illegal in California, perhaps he should have a conversation with them about that. But as it stands, he's sitting there and saying, well, why am I paying 380 bucks when I could just walk out of here for free? That's exactly what the criminals think, because that's exactly what happens. I walk out of here. I don't pay anything. Nothing happens to me. So what kind of sucker pays 380 bucks? He's, he's correct. Um, but yeah, so if, if he has a problem with, with that happening, you're the, you're the head of uh, the executive branch in the state. Go ahead and start prosecuting people. Incredible. Do you believe him that he was shocked at the site? Like he's never seen that in California. It's like. Oh, I don't know. I mean, this is probably the first time he's done his own shopping in a while or something. I mean, he surely has AIDS to do this. No, oh, he definitely has AIDS. Uh, that oh, much so I can, much that much I can believe for sure. Uh, anyway, we got to talk about the hooties. Many of those people probably have AIDS. Actually, we have to wait till, uh, wait a little longer to get to the hooties. Cause we didn't bomb the hooties first. We bombed, uh, Iranian backed non hootie militias in Iraq and Syria, but it's been another week of, uh, U S airstrikes in the middle East. And actually, before I get to those specifics, I have to catch up with what happened, what has happened in the week since, because of course it, it was a, um, as I spoke about last weekend with with Frank, this was a, a major. The events of last weekend were major insofar as we had actually the first U.S. service member deaths at the hands of an enemy mm-hmm. since the uh, October 7th Hamas attack in Israel. So we have American casualties by enemy fire in the Middle East. That was a major, you know, it's the major event that Frank and I discussed last weekend. But we got the identities of these people on Monday. And uh, these three soldiers are William Rivers, Kennedy Sanders, and Brianna Moffat. They were all part of an Army Reserve unit based in Fort Moore, Georgia. Forty more people were were wounded. As we discussed, it sounds like a situation where they're all sleeping early morning, and and this kamikaze drone that that apparently U.S. personnel thought was some of their own equipment just came in and blew the place up is the official story. And this, this outpost, this tower 22 in Jordan, but right on the border of uh, Iraq and, and Syria as well. Now in trying to honor these soldiers, Kareem Jean Pierre delivered. I, I think this is maybe the most awkward and clum, clumsy pieces of sound she has ever delivered, which is saying a lot for her, especially terrible. Here she was on Monday on MSNBC uh, <laughs> responding to the news. What I will say, our deepest, uh, obviously our deepest condolences uh, go out and our he- heartfelt condolences go out to the families uh, who lost uh, three, three brave uh, three brave, uh, three brave of uh, three folks who are, who are military folks who are brave, who are always fighting, who are fighting on behalf and of uh, this administration of the American people. Obviously, more so, more importantly. What? I, th- oh, I didn't that think was that a was a disaster. I thought someone edited that when I first heard the soundbite. Oh God, I do feel for these people though. Have you ever started a sentence and like in your mind you're talking, but you're like, this is a disaster. Many times and then, you can listen and then it to. Just, just goes downhill and there's nothing you can do. And you're like totally off the track and then it just tumbles and then you've said a bunch of stuff and that's what happened. I think part of the reason she stumbled so badly is because she was about to say men and women and realized you can't say that anymore. Really? You I think, think so? Oh. So now it's folks, which is a word. I just, ha- I just hate that word. I don't know why I just hate that word. It sounds stupid. Don't say folks. Oh boy. But three folks who are brave, who are military folks. That's what we've been reduced to in our honoring of the fallen. And not only that, but she made the gaffe at the end too of saying they died for, they died serving the administration, not serving the country, (laughs) not serving the constitution, not serving the protection of all of us. They died serving the administration. Oh no. And then she realized that's wrong too and corrected to say country. But 
all of that is a distraction. What's important is she's a Haitian immigrant lesbian, the first of her kind. And given the given the demographics, I'm surprised the White House did not say anything about the remarkable diversity of the casualties in yeah. this case. I mean, I don't, did we have a trans casualty? Did we have a Muslim casualty? So far, I, I don't. It looked pretty diverse. No comment on that. And then, of course, you know, if anybody does it worse than Kareem Jean Pierre, it's Joe Biden himself. Joe Biden, of course, has several recurring cringe routines. You've got the sniffing kids. We check in with that all the time. You've got the claiming that he saw two gay guys kissing on the streets of Wilmington as a young man when he was being dropped off by his dad. And his dad said, that's love, Joey. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just love. There's nothing weird about it in the 50s whenever he says this happened. And the, but the the most cringe of them all is the remember Bo bit. And, and that's because it's a bit that preys on those who are already suffering. It's not just yeah. awkward. It's not just a story that seems untrue. It's ruining a, mormon, a moment of mourning for someone who suffered a loss. And any time someone dies and Joe Biden is comforting, the people mourning that death, he has to bring up this Bo story and not just bring up Bo, but embellish it. Yep. Oh, it's every just, time. It's just like when Bo died, when Bo died, he died in Iraq. That's how I lost my son, Bo. Bo Biden, once again, was an army lawyer. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but Bo Biden was not some infantry man who was killed in action in Fallujah or something like that. He was an army lawyer. He died a year plus after he came back from Iraq of brain cancer. Now there are some who try to connect his presence in Iraq to the burn pits, to the brain cancer. Maybe, maybe all I'm saying is number one, not the same as getting shot by the enemy in Iraq. And number two, like a long time ago, let these people mourn their family now. Yeah. But Joe Biden did it again, telling the latest gold star family. He knows exactly what it's like because of Bo. Man, this guy. I know there's nothing anybody can say or do to excuse the pain. I've been there. We're promoting her posthumously to sergeant. Oh, wow. Thanks, that is sir. the best news I've heard today. Thank you so much. Well, I tell you what, it means a lot to, a lot to me. Uh, my son spent a year in Iraq until I lost him. And, uh, That's how I lost him. Dude. Anyway, uh, Biden is now avenging that soldier and Bo with new strikes in Syria, Iraq, and Yemen. After dancing around the topic most of the week and saying they're definitely going to do some stuff, but you're all going to have to wait and see just what kind of stuff. Later in the week, they finally kicked it off. The U.S. launched airstrikes on more than 85 targets within 30 minutes. Targets linked to Iran-backed militias in Iraq and Syria. 40 are reportedly dead in the aftermath. Iraq actually condemned the strikes, saying they refused to have their lands be the arena for settling scores between warring countries, referring to the U.S. and Iran. The Iraqi government says that the areas that were bombed were in close proximity with civilians. The White House says that it informed the Iraqi government of the plans before the strikes or the, the plans for the strikes uh, ahead of time. Rather, the Iraqi government disputes that claim. Uh, U.S. Lieutenant General Douglas Sims says the strikes appeared to be successful, noting that many triggered large secondary explosions, which would indicate that they hit weaponry. We also bombed some more hoodies yesterday. U.S. and U.K. forces bombed Houthi targets in Yemen from air and surface platforms. At least 30 targets were struck ac uh, across at least 10 different locations. As always, as you mentioned the other week with the Yemen targets, did we hit what we're aiming for? Don't know. How many people did we kill? Don't know. I don't know. At least I don't see it in the reporting. So now we're now with at consecutive days of bombing at least three different Middle Eastern countries from the guy who insisted it was actually the other guy who was going to recklessly get us into World War III. And don't get me wrong, Donald Trump did uh, a little bit of Middle Eastern bombing himself. We talked about it on the show. I'm not excusing him of that. But uh, I do find it funny that the people who warn about the recklessness of such activities suddenly engage in it. And perhaps you're wondering, well, why are we uh, messing around with all this foreplay? If we're just going to kick it off with Iran, 
like Lindsey Graham wa- uh, wants. He said last week, hit Iran and hit them hard now because Lindsey Graham loves that sort of thing in many ways. <laughs> uh, they're they're le- homosexual. <laughs> exactly. You know, um, <laughs> quick pause of the many pieces of value that Frank contributed to the show. Did you hear uh, did you hear his voice modulator? You are gay. Yeah, I, I love this bit. <laughs> you are gay. And he gave me a DVT. A DVT really? sound. Pain thrombosis. DVT. <laughs> yeah, it was great. So, did you get that test yet? Uh, no, March 7th. March okay. 7th is still a month away. But th- thank you for the you are gay sound. That, that one's you are gay. For, that one's for Lindsey Graham. So you're wondering, why don't we just go after Iran? Well, they're leaving that possibility open. Uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said, where, where's his quote? Something to the effect of, this is just the start. I don't know. I lost it, I guess. Uh, Lloyd Austin, the exact quote was, uh, this is just the start of our response. And then this morning on Meet the Press, uh, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan was asked if the strikes on Iran itself, uh, if, if strikes on Iran itself rather are being considered. Jake Sullivan said, I'm not not saying we're going to do it. The quote is, well, sitting here today on a national news program, I'm not going to get into what we've ruled in and ruled out from the point of military action. What I will say is that the president is determined to respond forcefully to attacks on our people. The president is also not looking for a wider war in the Middle East. And yet the Middle Eastern wars keep getting wider by the day. There's probably a nose joke to be made there, but I will leave it hanging. So if you thought Biden sucked for the first three years and he did just wait, there's still a fourth and, uh, you know, major international warfare remains a distinct possibility. If we continue on this trajectory, there's still plenty of time for things to get far worse. But, you know, you got to get the hooties before the hooties hoot you. I that's (laughs) that's all I know. I don't want to get hooted. Uh, this one thing is for sure. All right. Time for some hoax hate. I'm ready. And now the nobody saw it happen, but it's totally a product of Trump's America hoax hate crime of the week. Ah, shit, it's backwards. <laughs> This week on The View, in a contentious exchange with fellow co-host Alyssa Farah Griffin, Sonny Hostin claimed not just that most Americans are racist, or at least she disputed Griffin's claim that most Americans aren't. She's saying, if not a majority, a large number of Americans are racist because her son was recently called the N-word many times on the beach in Florida. And there are absolutely racist people in this country, this country. It is not the vast majority of people in this country. And I feel like we we don't know that. The FBI director said white supremacy is the biggest threat to our country today. Well, that still doesn't mean that that's the vast majority of people. I just don't believe that in my day to day life that the people that you're encountering harbor racist viewpoints. I do think that this division that we're creating. If you look like me, you would believe differently. But you know what, uh, Alyssa, the woman, help me understand. I think that there is a significant portion um, that are racist, and you can't dismiss my lived experience. And I, I never yeah, would when say I, yeah, I, don't, I, I would never do when I, I, I just experienced hope. my son walking down the beach being called the N word several times in Florida. There's, there is so don't you can't say I believe that the vast majority of people but, aren't racist. But again, I, we, we okay, don't know that's that. Fair. There are 300 million people in this country. Right. I would never minimize your lived experience any yeah. more than I would yeah. mine but, as but, an but Arab see, woman. Well, was he robbing somebody? <laughs> yeah, that- was he being an n-word i mean what do you what do you want like you know and this is a chicken or the egg situation like talk to me 10 years ago i did not give a crap about any of this stuff i wasn't a born racist i was made i was i was i've been made racist i, okay? I was gonna say sunny hostin she might be wrong today but she has now plus one to me so we are one plus one closer <laughs> to a majority racist country by virtue of her nonsense yeah uh, what am I supposed to do about this? Like, what now, do you want me to say? There is the question as to, there are multiple questions about his own behavior. Again, if her 21 year old son, Gabriel would come forward to 
corroborate this claim. It doesn't necessarily have to be that he was victimizing others. That's one hypothesis. Another hypothesis I've read is perhaps he was, uh, I don't know, hanging out with friends who use that word casually (laughs) and they tossed it at him in potentially even a friendly way. Or Uh, maybe this didn't happen. A racist person would not do this. Because somebody that's truly racist recognizes the threat that black people pose. And you don't want to go up to like a peak crime age black guy. Well, she said he was 21. Well, who wants to go up to a 21 year old black guy and call him the N word? It's like, no, you you go home, you FaceTime your friend and then you call him an N word. You won't get you won't believe what what I just saw a black guy in public, (laughs) which offends me as a known racist. Uh, Now, out of respect, if I saw this happening, I would not interrupt his arduous journey through the polar vortex in Florida to get to the subway at two in the morning to obtain the sandwich or the salad, whatever he was seeking when this allegedly happened. I know. Uh, no yeah, word. I don't, did son, has Sonny Hostin or her son Gabriel confirmed whether or not a, uh, a very poorly constructed noose was involved in this. My guess either. is yes. Well, that, that seals it. If there was a noose claim, then I, I'm a believer. Kaniga. <laughs> uh, okay. It's, it's This is uh, it's not a hoax. I mean, this really happened. We talked about it on the show. But of course, the story would develop this way. That guy who beheaded the state, the Satan statue at the Iowa State Capitol a few weeks or months back. I forget when that was. They're going after him for a hate crime. A hate crime. Satan is the victim of a hate crime. Yeah. So Michael Cassidy drove to Iowa after the satanic display was erected at the state capitol and took it down, uh, beheaded it. But he's being charged with felony third degree criminal mischief, of course, adorable, saying that he acted in violation of individual rights under Iowa's hate crime statute. Can you believe that? So because this was erected as some sort of religious display because of equal time at the Capitol. Yes, but what it really was, because the Polk County Attorney's Office said uh, that the evidence shows the defendant made statements to law enforcement and the public indicating he destroyed the property because of his own religion. Oh, because of his religion or wait, no, no because, because, of, because of, the of the victim's, victim's religion. religion. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Um, so, and that's why it resulted in hate crime. Right. So hatred of Satanism is right. a, um, aggravating factor in because his- Satanism is a valid religion. Is that what they're, I, I suppose, um, but th- this is how weird and twisted this hate crime nonsense gets. Again, I'm not I get why you would treat this as a criminal matter to the extent it's vandalism of public property. And as we talked about it at the time, if this guy opposes it that much and he he accepts the consequences for his actions. OK, I mean, I guess you could consider that a, a form of civil disobedience or however you want to characterize it. But whether he commits the act because he loves Jesus or he hates Satan. What freaking difference does it make? It's, it's just like, and, and again, it, it, it gets so morally twisted because some things should be hated, namely evil. If you don't hate evil, if instead you love evil, you're kind of evil. You're kind of bad. Yeah, totally. So when we act like all hate, I agree that on account of your hate, you don't have a right to attack another person or their property. But when we act like this is an aggravating factor, it, it acts like all hate is equally invalid when it is not some hate is perfectly justified. You have a right to all of it within your own mind, first and foremost, oh, but yeah, some yeah. things should be hated because they're bad. And the devil, <laughs> he might be, he might be one of them. You might make the argument that, uh, he, he should be hated for any number of reasons. Just weird. It's, it's such a, <laughs> this is final form hate crime though. He hated Satan. And so he must be punished more severely. More severely, yeah. It's it's mind-bogglingly retarded. Anyway. Uh, all right. This one, did you read this note in this story? Yeah. I thought for sure this was fake. And uh, a few of you in, in the audience sent this story to me, which is how I found it. So thank you for that. But I thought for sure it was fake. Now they're saying, not, they're not just saying, I, I've i seen the guy's letter posted on Gab. So it's it's real. Uh And the the guy who threatened this DEI official in Portland, Maine, he's a known white supremacist who posts on Gab. And I did confirm I saw his Gab post. So that that part's legit. It's not a 
it's not a hoax, but I, I get a kick out of the um, the AP headline here. Threatened. When a white supremacist threatened an Iraqi DEI coordinator in Maine, he fled the state. This is South Portland, Maine. The diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator of public schools there in Portland, Maine, resigned and left the state saying he fears for his family's safety after he received a threatening letter from a white supremacist. Again, threatening letter. Not mean letter. Not a uh, letter colorful with its language, which we'll get to. Threatening. That's that's the characterization. Muhammad Albehandli is an Iraqi refugee. Says getting this letter was just like his time in Iraq. He knows from experience how quickly threats can escalate. The letter was sent December 29th and has since been obtained by the Associated Press through a Freedom of Information Act request, which I thought was hilarious. All these um, all these news outlets are like, we, we've, t- we've obtained the email. We've obtained the email through our diligent Freedom of Information request uh, as, as, as credible journalists. I'm like, oh, I went to the guy's gab where he just posted a screenshot of it himself. You didn't, you didn't really have to go through all <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, really. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to go to that work. Uh, but good for you. Good for you for using your journalistic legal pathways. Okay, so they 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 have reviewed the letter. And as I was reading about this in the first case, I thought, well, okay, you have the contents of the letter, but you're not going to tell me what's in the letter. It just says it contains racist epithets and indicates that this guy should go back to the Middle East where he belongs. Okay, but what did it say? Like, can I read it? No, 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 no. Far too racist. Far too mean. Far too threatening. The school superintendent describes the letter as the most vile email message he has ever seen or received in his 35 years in education. And as we'll get to, it's uh, I wouldn't be surprised to learn that he hasn't received a ton of emails like this one. Let's put it that way. I'm not I'm not saying that the email was not um, edgy. I'm just saying he, he, he didn't issue a threat. That's all. We'll get to it. Similar emails have come from the same sender. Uh, they've been uh, there've been similar emails sent by the same guy to other officials of color in the area, including city councilors. The sender is identified in this AP reporting as Ryan Murdoch. I believe that's how you pronounce it anyway. Uh, the New Hampshire founder of the New England White Network. Murdoch is active on Gab, a social networking site popular with white nationalists, the reporting says. And... Um, and he said that he has received a no trespass notice for school property in South Portland, along with a, pro- a police officer's warning that hate speech like this can be viewed as a threat. OK. There's a quote from Mr. Murdoch in here. Honestly, I don't care about Muhammad. He told the Associated Press in an email. Uh, he, he said that by targeting diversity efforts, he's speaking up for white families. That's what he says. Uh now, uh, again, without having seen the content of the letter, I'm reading between the lines here and I'm thinking, you're telling me this guy has sent repeated emails to multiple officials in this in Portland, Maine, and they're all threatening and they're all very racist, but the police have not arrested him. He's not been charged with any crime. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He apparently did the bit of um, the Asian guy in Minneapolis. He did the uh, go back to where you came from. That's all he sent to this guy. <laughs> go back to where you came from, it. okay? He sent him an email that says, go back to where you came from, okay. <laughs> I, I was convinced of that. Like, I got to find the text of this email because if it was, there's, a, there's another quote in some local reporting here. Part of the letter said, white people in Maine don't appreciate what you're trying to do. So I immediately thought of the Hitler meme kid who, who, <laughs> where he gave his teacher the Hitler drawing and said, I don't appreciate you. And that was a, a hate speech incident. White people in Maine don't appreciate what you're trying to do in South Portland. You are making people hate you. Do you really think you're going to be able to pull this off and have people like it? Okay. You might consider that distasteful or politically incorrect or whatever you, it's not a threat though. Where's the threat? Where, I, finally, I'm like, okay, well, if he posts on Gab, maybe he has issued a statement on Gab. Yeah. I go to his Gab page and I find the email, a screenshot that he has posted himself. It's because you did all the deep work of a, of a serious journalist <laughs> yeah. that you were able to find this. Now, the content of the email. Hello, Muhammad. Again, this is, this is a, I had to blur some things for compliance with various community guidelines. Uh, white people in Maine don't appreciate what you're trying to do in Portland. The city is already turning into an African bad place. And now bad guys like you want to make it even worse. White parents don't want their children going to school with um, with with diverse experiences that might not belong in the United States, he says. Again, 
I'm not defending the content of the email. I'm not saying this is the correct opinion. I'm just saying I don't see the threat. Where's the threat? Why does scum like you believe that access to white people is a right? Bad guys like you are creating. I didn't even know that one was a slur, but it's an M word. It's an M word. M words like you are creating white nationalists every day. You're making people hate you. Do you really think you're going to be able to pull this off and have people like it? Go back to the Middle East where you belong. And the guy did, apparently. <laughs> he said, I'm out of here. Whatever yeah. whatever Ryan wants, I'm I'm leaving. Now, again, unkind language, is it mean? Sure. Is it uh distasteful? Whatever. I'll grant I'll grant that criticism. Um Where's the threat? Again, the headline in AP's reporting threatened an Iraqi DEI coordinator. No, he didn't. He said, I don't like your Not stupid face. Yeah. And and the, he's offering a substantive criticism of the policy that this guy is trying to push, which is diversifying schools for the sake of diversity. The legal standard for issuing a threat is very high. Well, that's why he's not the being journalistic charged. standard. Very low, very low. I, to, to the people writing threat, I just, I want to know the quote in there that they think is a threat. Is it the mm-hmm. slurs? Granted, there are a couple slurs, but just saying a slur, is that a threat? Of course not. Uh, saying go back, issuing a directive, go, go to a place. Not, mm-hmm. I will capture you and take you and against your will. And then forcibly take you there. Yeah. It's, you should, hey, you should, uh, you should go over there. That's not a threat. It's just, it's interesting how these things get twisted. And now when I, when I went and read the content of the letter too, it's like, well, okay, the content, they're right. It's like, it's colorful language. There are slurs in it. Um, is that why they didn't want me to read it though? Is cause the language is bad it's or because you'll read it and be like, yeah, I mean, I, this is not how I would express myself if I wrote to Muhammad as a Portland resident. But if he was diversifying my kid's school for the sake of diversity, that was mm-hmm. the value that was being pushed. Like we just want certain demographics in your kid's classroom for that sake. I would have similar uh, questions, points of criticism. I'd say I don't think that that's yeah. a proper yeah, value yeah. in my kid's education. I think that policy ought to be reconsidered. That's a, well. Just, that's a threat. That's a threat. But yeah, police can't arrest him. Police can't. He's going to keep sending emails. This Ryan character uh, of the of the white network. <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, I'm not trying to criticize the branding. I just think the, it's literally the New England white network. We are the white network. White. Well, all right. I, I don't know where Muhammad went. Did he in fact go back to the Middle East? Unclear. He left though. I hope so. All right. Time for the movie review. Already? Mm Mm-hmm. We're actually late. In a world of movie references flying over his head, one man will finally watch them. This is the Matt and Blonde Show movie review. This week's movie is the 1973 Charlton Heston sci-fi murder mystery Soylent Green in which a police detective in an overpopulated New York City future investigates a murder and learns the horrible truth. The corporate 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 sludge, corporate <laughs> sludge everyone eats. Spoiler alert. If you haven't seen the movie, turn, take off it's your people. <laughs> the, the soil and green is made of people from movie picker electric ninja back when sci-fi was dark and serious this one is a classic charlton heston really knew how to pick them this film is 50 years old but if you haven't seen it yet do not let anyone spoil the ending even though i just did so sorry electric ninja too late it is indeed people uh as far as the face swap artwork (laughs) uh, i love this i can try on so many hairstyles I, I thought I looked like a gay Han Solo in the bottom right. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, a, it's a weird look. And then uh, you as the... How many uh, times have I been a prostitute in these? Yeah, it's, well, especially lately. It was, uh, what was the latest Clint Eastwood one we saw? Unforgiven, that was that. Um, you as the uh, old man academic. <laughs> anyway... Uh, Oh, oh, the clip. I forgot the, the, uh, the, we have the face swap clip too. And, um, I just appreciate that he ended it at the appropriate point. 
You got hot water here. Very hot. Gee. I haven't had a hot bath. I'll rub you down afterwards. Cut it right there. Thank you. I hate the ones where we have sexual tension. I, uh, I agree. Don't but, do this anymore. <laughs> but uh, Jamie and Janie who do the AI artwork, they have uh, apparently some appreciation for that. So I allow it within reason. But uh, if they would have done the next scene, I would have. Uh, no, we're not doing that. All right. Oh, uh, as always, your review and your rating. Okay. Um, as far as dystopian movies go, this landed somewhere in the middle for me. I liked it, but I generally like this genre um top marks for predicting the future climate crisis chef's kiss my problem with it is that i wish it had more horror elements and it was characteristic of movies at the time but like i feel like i wanted to be traumatized you know when i see a dystopian movie like the road like that movie stuck with me for like years i I still think about it all the time um but it it did really stay true to some of these dystopian themes like food scarcity and then the top down control of these bloodthirsty government officials. And then Charlton Heston. Oh, my God, he's so hot. He delivers just this excellent performance and he's so brawny and uh, he's just he's just so hot. We just don't get that anymore. You know, we just don't have that kind of man actor that is just dripping with testosterone you just never talk back to him but you kind of want to you know just see he doesn't even do the best whore beating in the uh in the he movie doesn't. which he i doesn't. will get to i don't know all in all i i i liked it uh four to five i took one off because i do for a dystopian film i feel like i wish it had been more disturbing hmm. i am pretty close uh this is one of those movies that I, I love in its big concepts. And I feel like there's a really good movie here. Maybe I'm too used to modern movies. And so this one is just kind of what year was it? It was 73. So mm. part of it is the way the story is presented. Like the presentation doesn't really work for me because of some of the plot points explored at too much length. And the other part, I think it's close to what you're saying is, I feel like it really could have benefited from some more impressive effects or something to in give the it 70s. a seventies. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so that's the reason it doesn't land in the excellent category for me, even though I like the big themes and there are so many of these big themes to talk about. Um, this idea that environmental sustainability is, is actually anti-human. And mm-hmm. I, I think we see examples of that all the time. I don't say that to be, anti-environmentalist of course i want my family my kids myself i want all of us to grow up in a in a clean environment where we can utilize all the resources of the natural world in the way that uh you know god intended uh and so it's not like i hate like i'm not saying go pollute the rivers and cut down the rainforest it's not that but it's when environmentalism is the chief value and and environmentalism is not a sub value of serving human interest that's how it gets perverted in this weird way and all of a sudden humans are expected to sacrifice for the planet i mean maybe we should insofar as the planet is necessary for human survival but that's the point like without humans is the earth of value yes or no and yeah there are there are a great many who i think would say the earth is actually of superior value to human beings and that's how we get this weird twist where um, environmentalism itself becomes anti-human in the way that it, it kind of did in this movie. Or, you know, I guess if another way to think about it in, in this movie, too, is it's not necessarily environmentalist ideology. It's the practical reality of a world that's overpopulated. It's not like save the planet. It's like we literally don't have enough food. So you have to eat people yeah. now. So maybe it's that. But anyway, there's also this theme related to that, like kill yourself to save the planet. We got these kind of industrial suicide operations where you just head down to the medical clinic and they'll put on this great nature show for you while you die. Yeah. And uh, if if we're not already there, we're sort of on the trajectory. On to the track. This, yeah, totally. this, Especially Canada. Yeah. yeah. Where it's like a, a big portion of the medical industry or, or, what is supposed to be a life sustaining life saving industry is actually death itself in this horribly ironic twist. 
it, it, a big theme of the movie is very relevant to today. Maybe wise to ask a few questions about corporate chemicals. Now, Soylent Green predicted we'd learn this lesson in 2022. That's when this story is supposed to take place. Kind of eerie how they were just a year or two late. Of course, I'm not talking about the context of food. Certainly, you could argue there's plenty of corporate poisoning going on with the food supply, too, obviously. Um, but I'm just thinking of the way that the uh, the injectable developed. You know, Soylent Green was safe mm-hmm. and effective, too, until some people started asking some questions about it. And and again, just like environmentalism, I'm not saying this to be like anti-corporate. Oh, I hate all businesses. Business corporations, large business operations, they can improve our lives with all sorts of innovations and products and awesome things. I'm not saying that out of hate for them. It's just that when you allow anybody, whether it's an, an individual or a group of people in the form of a corporation, when you allow them to exist above scrutiny and the asking of questions, you've elevated them to a status beyond humanity itself. You've made them gods. And when you do that, they do ungodly things because they're humans who make either mistakes or they're evil. And yeah. uh, you learn that lesson in Soylent Green. I thought uh, I, I love the the symbolism of the I don't know what the technical term for the vehicles are, but the, the scoopy dump trucks that they're scooping people with. They're they're called scoopy dump trucks. Scoopy dump trucks. The Soylent Green Scoopy dump trucks are kind of like this metaphorical mirror image to the Killdozer. In the same way the Killdozer represents the reasonable man who's got to do unreasonable things, the the dump trucks are what the state or the powers that be will do without the threat of that unreasonability. So one is kind of a check on the other. We all have to decide, do you want to drive the Killdozer or do you want to get scooped by the Scoopy dump truck? And the correct answer is, You have to know how to build and drive the dozer, (laughs) but have the moral restraint to deploy it only when absolutely necessary. You save the dozer for when the Scoopy trucks show up. Uh, I I, I love the imagery of the Scoopy trucks. It was a great part of this movie. I thought the twist um, was great. I'm I'm sorry if I 50 years after the fact I've spoiled it for anybody else. Um, I, I did not know the twist. Uh, when I watched the movie. Oh yeah, so neither did I. I actually didn't really see it coming. Uh, and the way, the reason I like the twist is not just because it's a surprise, but because this was a movie that had me wondering like, okay, you got this like murder side story and then you got whatever's going on with this Soylent Green and it's not really clear how they're related. In comes the twist to tie those up. Exactly what you've been wondering about for the last hour and a half or however long the movie is. So it, it really did a good job of tying up those yeah. Um, seemingly divergent plot lines. And I mentioned uh, just it's it's a it's a it's a, a relic of a bygone era. Just excellent whore beating when that Charles guy, the <laughs> really good the gut that punches. One, that one whore was like, whoa, her across the face. <laughs> this is, he's the apartment building manager. I don't even get why he's doing it. I guess like um, Thorne Heston's character has them all over because they weren't supposed them. to be hanging out or something. something like that. I don't even know why he's beating their asses. But it reminded, first of all, it was slapstick comic relief in the movie that could use a joke here or there. But I just, it made me think of, of Sean Connery too. Like Sean Connery should have played this role. Uh, okay. Now why didn't, I, I clearly have a lot of praise for it. Why didn't, why didn't this get higher marks for me? Number one, I thought the, sh- the Cheryl story, the, the, you know, his whore girlfriend, mostly a big waste of time. Uh, what? I, it, it, it's, it's a force She was to me. beautiful though. I'm not disputing her, the actress. It's just the, the, the story. Like it's a forced romance. It goes nowhere. It means absolutely nothing to the main plot. And there's really no resolution in the end. He just, as I'll get to, he makes a ridiculous phone call to her. Like, Oh, you should continue living a whore's life. Also, I have this very important information that really the whole world needs to know, but I'm not going to tell you right now. See you later. Okay. She, and she just continues being a whore for a different rich guy. Like there's not really any meaningful, it's a tough life, okay? They're eating people. I thought he was going to give her some sort of redemption arc, but it doesn't mm. happen. That's okay. That's legitimate. All right. There's a big question. You waste a bunch of time with this weird romance. There's a big question that goes unanswered that I would have liked to see a little bit of time devoted to, which is what's next, okay? Everyone knows now that Soylent Green is people. What do they do now? Do they mm. starve? Do they go, well, 
I mean, we have to yeah. cannibalize. That's just the way it is. What happens next to me is a much more interesting question than like, who's on this piece of furniture, as they're called today? Um, I, I thought it was so bizarre that how long Thorn waited to deliver the news. So he watches his friend saw the old academic guy die and the, the guy knows the secret. That's why he's killing himself. He knows that Soylent Green is people and he whispers to Thorn, like, by the way, Soylent Green is people and Thorn's like, holy shit, this changes everything. But then he has to go find himself, go find out for himself. Right. I mean, so I guess he needed to confirm it, but I would have just immediately been like telling people like right away. So he goes to confirm, which like, okay, I mean, you just easily walked into this mega corporation's facility that <laughs> has the that they don't guard the greatest secret in the world very closely. Apparently, fine. You just go in there, you confirm it. Okay. Then, after confirmation, he runs around until he reaches a phone, and that's when he calls Cheryl. Not even on that phone call. He, he listen, Cheryl. I have big news. And so he's like, no time, no time. Well, why don't you have time? No, I love you. It's very important that you continue living a whore's life. Bye bye now. You're not going to tell her. That, by the way, Soylent Green is people. That's pretty big news. Yeah. So he, he doesn't tell her. Then he connects to the, the police chief. <laughs> the, the guy in charge of law enforcement in the city. And he, there's a bad connection or whatever. He doesn't tell the police chief either. He then continues running and gets in a gunfight, gets shot in the leg and eventually makes it to the church, which is a safer place. Instead of going to the church where the massive people are and saying, holy shit, you guys, Soylent Green is people. Don't eat any more of that. He's like sneaking around like, oh, these people are sleeping. I wouldn't want to disturb their slumber. I want to be polite about this. Then finally, the police chief helps him and he's getting carried away. Oh, by the way, Soylent Green is people, guys. He buried the lead. <laughs> yeah. He he ran around doing a lot of unrelated things, tell, talking to people, but not telling them the important news. It's just weird. It's a very weird way to finish the story. It's like he forgot the point of the movie or something. And then this is th this last point is really insignificant, but I just didn't get it stylistically. Why does everyone sleep on the stairs? There is plenty of room in the streets. There's plenty of room on the floor. It's got to be the most uncomfortable place to sleep, right? I would assume. It was, but why are the stairs preferable to so many people? And I thought, and they kept showing it. So I'm thinking like, well, this isn't just like a one weird shot. They keep showing him hopping over people sleeping on the stairs. So there's got to be some metaphor, or some symbol to it or some significance. And they just kept showing it. And I kept not getting it. Why are people sleeping on the stairs? I don't, I don't know. So anyway, it, um, there are things I love and there are things I really don't. So it evened out to a three wiki rating for me. Okay. Okay. I'll allow it. As I said, I think it could make a great, it's a great candidate for a modern remake. I think there's a pretty good movie here, if not a great one. I just, some of the presentation choices just didn't work for me. 70s. You don't like 70s flicks, I think. It was different pacing back then. We, we just watched The Exorcist and that was just, yeah, I didn't really like that either. I'm trying to think. There's got to be at least a few. I, I think One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest I thought was decent. Or did I when give that a three Josie too? Wales? I can't remember. Was that Josie Wales was a five for sure. Josie Wales is one of my favorite movies. Was that the seven? I think it was the seven. Yeah. That's one of my favorite we've watched in the entire history of the bit. So that would be, that would be the one. Uh, as far as the uh, audience rating, uh, people are giving it threes and fours right in the range that we gave it to. And it's pretty even split. Like a third of people giving it a three, a third of people giving it a four and a sixth or so giving it a five. So kind of polarizing views. Well, I, maybe not polarizing. Mostly positive, I, sh I should say. Mostly positive, but not uh, necessarily in love with it. Uh, okay. Uh, next week is uh, Emperor's New Groove. I don't know anything about that. Some kind of... Oh, I can watch it with Emily. Yeah, it's a kid's movie, so that helps. And then uh, we have remaining nominations for February from listener Gabe. How to Train Your Dragon, Zootopia, Atlantis, The Lost Empire, Tangled, What Happened to Monday, Oscar, Mr. Right. Or, of course, you can reject the list in favor of a randomly selected top rated movie instead. And as a reminder, if you'd like to read my movie reviews, comment how wrong I am, submit your own rating, vote for the next movie and sign up for the chance to be the movie nominator for the month. The one and only place to do it is in my weekly movie review column linked in the description and on the homepage of the website. That is Matt Christensen media.com and or Matt is dot gay. <laughs> Catch up with our chatters. Sure. 
I got some on Rumble. If uh, yeah, uh, yeah, let's uh, yeah. I can get through these pretty quickly. We can get back to uh, YouTube and Tippy. And there is one more on Odyssey as well. Um, on Rumble, Nix eighty four says, "Love you guys to brighten uh, you brighten up my Monday mornings listening from Switzerland." So oh. usually can't do live. My contribution is long overdue. So, <laughs> so I will not be N wordly. I have learned that uh, I can't say that word. Only Bernie Sanders from his 1980s um, mayoral debate in Burlington, <laughs> or whatever that was. He's the only one who could say it. So thank you for that. Uh, I am not going to be niggardly. May Jesus enlighten your hearts. Well, thank you very much for that. And thanks for your support for the show. All the best over in Switzerland. It's crazy to think, uh, you know, people. Tune in from all the various corners of the world, and I appreciate that. Uh, Raymond Donovan is gay. Massachusetts uh, governor. Pool's closed, and he has a, a black guy emoji. So uh, apparently it's, yeah, uh, I, I wonder how Corn Pop would feel about this, cl- closing, yeah, really. the, closing the pool to the uh, black people. But it's those immigrant kids. They need swimming lessons. They truly do. Lightweight, pretty sure the migrant families who just swarm the Rio Grande. It's <laughs> a fair point. Pretty, pretty sure the migrant families who just swarm the Rio Grande are good on swim lessons. Cute baby. <laughs> Love you guys. That's true. They did uh, exhibit some skill to get across the river, perhaps. Dick Boner. Some might ask what other kind of boner there is, but uh, Dick Boner. Sorry, I, I'm still on the Soylent Green thing here. <laughs> That's because I'm mesmerized by chat names like Dick Boner. Pour a 40 out to blondes ghetto fetal alcohol syndrome schnoz. <laughs> Congrats. Pour, pour a 40 Ooh. out. Congrats uh, and well wishes to Let's you. And down. Yours. Thank you. I'm so pleased. I think it's going to go back to the way it was. All right. I think. Thank you, Dick we'll Boner. See. Laser 47. Matt and I once made love in the Statue of Liberty, a uh, group of invaders joined in and began giving us the double middle finger. Nikki Pelosi gave everyone involved the medal of Gatum. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, over on Odyssey. Mike Hawk, once again. Well, after watching the hoax hate segment, the hate in my heart has been restored. <laughs> wait, wait. Oh, oh, oh okay. For a sec- he said, um, He said he he advocated unkind treatment for the DEI representatives. And uh, I th- I read it at first as REI representatives, like the store. <laughs> but that also applies. They also deserve unkind treatment for what they've done. Uh, rowdy dude. <laughs> I, think, I think the point on Odyssey is just uh, to get away with saying the N word. I think I think that's just what totally. you do over there. He said the N word. Good night. N words. Good show. Well, thank you uh we're set we're set over there uh good on d live as well thank you guys over there let's catch up with youtube where were you i left off on moist farts and the one about patrick ewing injured guardian is what i have next and boogie i love y'all keep up the good work rant neil sucks the censorship the wrong the wrongful holds on my credit card and delayed and or mangled super chats are all serious pain in the school yes i of course appreciate your support wherever you choose uh, so I would not attempt to sway you in a direction you may not want to go, but I will say that there are alternatives on Rumble and there are alternatives on it's Tippy true. Stream, and they don't keep the money that Raja Muhan does, but the choice is yours. Raja Muhan, you Appreciate it, Injured Guardian. Boogeyman917 says, congrats, Blonde. Thank you so much. Zach Log the Great. What's the difference between Blonde and Fort Knox? Fort Knox is impregnable. For jokes that will not make fun, not make blonde want to murder me, look up Zach Log on YouTube. Gap, WordPress. Thank you, Zach Log. We appreciate it. Thank you, Zach. Um, Margie, congratulations, Rebecca. Living for your pearly tweets. Lol. I was in such a fucking rage at Just Pearly Things on Twitter. We were in a vicious battle of words. Oh, you don't like on her? Twitter. No. Oh. I hate her and I talk about it all the time. I was under the impression you were a fan. Like, no, she's the worst. God, she's just the worst. She's so stupid and tall and redheaded. She's such a oh. <laughs> God, she's so tall. My hair. Anyway. Okay. I, I was rage tweeting at her and then she retweeted me and I look and I have like hundreds of notifications because her channel's really big. 
So I was rage tweeting at her and I went into labor. <laughs> I think that that might have been what did it. Now you can tell that story to your daughter in the future. And then she tweeted, now I'm sending these crazy bitches into labor. Well, maybe you guys could come together on peace and harmony through that. No fucker. Uh, Again, more blonde. You looking thick. My N-word boss would slap that ass. It's true. Having a baby is really weird because there's no baby in there, but you're still like all fat. I just like I'm like sloppy and fat. My body is just trashed right now. Well, you have an <sighs> excuse, but um, I am I'm amazed how quickly it falls off. Like all that weight goes away. It mostly splashes yeah, on that's the floor. True. You know? it's, it's, I've it's, been losing three pounds a day. Yeah, it's it is crazy. Yeah. Uh, injured guardian, possibly over spe- overly specific humor when scrapping circuit boards and determining if they're low grade, mid grade or high grade. I remember the Titanic review, Matt, solid mid. Blonde, what? I hated that movie. Uh, yeah, I, I, I remember that. I like uh, Titanic. I just hate old Rose. I, I know. Thank you, Injured Guardian. Uh-huh. She's like, oh, I had a family and a loving husband and children, and I'm just going to reflect fondly on this, this peasant that I banged on a boat 70 years ago. I carry around then I'm framed gonna... photos of me riding a horse I, in his honor. Just... Totally psychotic. And then I'm going to throw a $12 million diamond that I could bequeath to my children into the ocean. It's like, you old bitch. God, wouldn't Jack have wanted her to enrich her future family with the freaking heart of the ocean? Why would Jack have advocated throwing it into his watery grave? It makes no sense. God, it's so stupid. It's so stupid. Tortuga, blonde, congratulations on a beautiful baby girl and the reduction of your nose size. You're nearing mulatto levels already. Wow. Thank you. One day, I hope to look like a white person again and not an albino black person. I'm getting there. I think it's looking good. Greatly Daniel improved. Yeager. <laughs> I like the Lawrence Lessig interview, but it was a missed opportunity to talk about the unprecedented draft opinion leak. Well, first of all, how dare you? I only do perfect interviews and there's never a single flaw. How dare you? Uh, yeah, I, it would have been interesting to hear his thoughts. Uh, also, you know, I asked him for a half hour of his time and I, I do have to be respectful of that. And I don't know, maybe he has some insight. I suppose if I get another conversation with him, I could ask him about that. My understanding is his Supreme court in, I mean, he was, he was a clerk a long time ago, um, decades ago, like in the early part of Scalia's, uh, time on the bench. So he might have some insight about like how clerks operate and stuff and whether a clerk is at fault or the culprit of the leak. But, uh, but yeah, I, I I guarantee he doesn't know who leaked. And well, the thing about the leak, we'll never know that as that investigation is just closed now, as far as I understand. Yeah. Oh, well, we couldn't find who did it. It was probably Sotomayor herself. That's who did it. Now, (laughs) the other thing that was interesting in the Lessig interview is he thinks that the Supreme court will decide unanimously against Colorado. That even Sotomayor and for institutional reasons, Kagan and maybe Jumanji Brown Jackson, that they will all get in line because like Brown v. Board, there will be behind the scenes politicking if they dare get out of line because the chief justice will want this to be a unanimous decision. So there's no appearance of political influence. Like if they come if they come down six, three or like five, four, that that would be a very damaging decision, even if it overturned Colorado and Trump state on the ballot. But, mm-hmm. uh, but anyway, the Daniel, uh, thank you for tuning into the interview. I appreciate it. And I'm glad you found some value in it. It's, um, it's a conversation I did not expect to have happen. It's not every day you email a Harvard law professor and they're like, okay, sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Whatever. <laughs> Especially cause in the video I made referencing his work, I accused him of having Trump derangement syndrome, <laughs> but he, he didn't, he didn't take offense to it. it Either cool that or he didn't it. watch the video, which is also a distinct possibility. Um, Phil. It's funny how all of a sudden conservatives have found a dual citizen they want to deport. Nothing was said when little Benny and his cousins were celebrating the end of whites in America. But the second a Somalian shoots her mouth off, then it's on. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Yeah. Fair. I mean, uh, that's the thing. There's I mean, it's never going to happen. Did they did they do anything more in Congress? I think there was an effort to effort to censure her. Uh, I got into that a little bit on my Wednesday show. Nothing's going to happen in Congress, of course. but and I certainly agree with the the point of hypocrisy there. The point of hypocrisy goes to her too, though. 
because she's she's defending what she said and offering a second translation that softens what she said about like, hey, listen, I represent Somalia from inside the U.S. system. Uh, th- that for her to criticize dual loyalty from other people and then turn around and say it's valid for me to represent Somalian interest in the U.S. Congress is a is a complete joke too. Not that I think Phil would disagree or that Phil thinks Ilhan Omar is an otherwise outstanding member of Congress. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it, uh, it is frustrating. And, and I agree that if you have questions about loyalty in that context, loyalty should extend to any and all countries, um, regardless. So, yep. but it won't, it, 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 even though, even though we have a member of Congress, like, Oh yeah, I represent a foreign country here. Uh, nah, won't matter. I was wondering on my Wednesday show, could Ilhan Omar actually shoot down a Black Hawk with an RPG just like Black Hawk down, Mogadishu style? Would Democrats vote to kick her out of Congress then if she did that? That'd be so awesome. Nancy Pelosi would still say, oh, she just misunderstood. It was a mistake. She didn't know the trigger fired the rocket. Yeah, really. She aimed she it by accident. She didn't mean to fuck her brother. It's, she didn't... Well, yeah. That, there's that component to Ilhan Omar too, the, uh, the questions about how her family gained the citizenship. Amazing llama. John McCain sucks. Yes, he does. Emma, congratulations, Bond, on completing your family. So happy for you that your last birth was so easy and uneventful. Your daughter will be bosom friends in no time. God bless. Thank you. Rich, I know Matt stated he wasn't interested in debating Professor Larry during the interview, a decision I agree with. Though it would be nice to ask why uh, he pearl clutches over Abbott defying SCOTUS while Biden did it also via squatters and student debt reallocation. Yeah. Uh, fair point for, and thank you for supporting the show too. Appreciate it very much. Um, I am not going to be niggardly. And th- those are questions I would have too about, um, you know, the, the exercise, the exercise of supposed Supreme court defiance. Now in this case, when he's talking to his point was Abbott has, is doing something unprecedented in defying a Supreme court order. From my perspective, I would dispute the characterization that Abbott is defying a Supreme Court order because the Supreme Court order did not order him to remove fence or stop building fence. What it what it does is it it says you cannot stop the feds from removing fence if that's what they want to do. So I I don't agree with the characterization. I certainly would counter with the points that you've made that uh, Biden has done his fair share of uh, Supreme Court defiance. And I, I bet. Professor Lessig would would probably grant some of that. Um, yeah. Like, are those thoughts in my head? Yeah. Um, but for me, and and as the point that you're making here with the with the chat, I'm bringing him on to talk about a specific legal issue on which he has a lot of knowledge and expertise. And if that's what I want, then I'm going to have to allow like a little bit of tangential mention of stuff that maybe I don't agree with in the interest of staying on track to the topic that I'm very interested in. If I only have X amount of his time, it's like, do I want to take up the sword for Abbott? Even if I think that Abbott, the characterization of Abbott is incorrect. No, not really. Like if the, if he, if, you know, if someone comes down, they really hammer the point. Like they really want to make it an Abbott debate then maybe, but you know, he, he mentions it in passing and it's like, yeah, that's not I, I, you know, I, I can't stand when, when interviews that are about a certain topic, to get lost in some other, other detail topic. that's kind of unrelated, yeah. Yeah. even though, you know, it's broadly related to the theme of constitutional law here. I get it. But, but yeah, I just, um, I want to hear what he has to say about the topic. So I try to keep it that way. And, and obviously you could, you could tell that rich and I appreciate you checking it out. Um, Hal Edwards, at least the senators know now why the hearing room smells like ass. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Whoever, what what's the next big meeting in that office uh, or in that hearing room? Like there's no Supreme court justice confirmations coming up soon, but like, who's the next witness Zuckerberg had a big hearing this week. Where was that handled? I don't know. Did you see that nonsense this week? Everyone accusing Zuck of killing their kids. No. Oh God. The baby bubble. The premise, the premise of, so Zuck went to a, a hearing this week. And they're trying to pass this new law to restrict Facebook and X, Y, Z. And they brought in all these moms whose kids were killed by Facebook, by which they mean like one kid. Ugh, one, don't make me defend. Yeah. They, and then they, they, they put first off, Lindsey Graham stood up there and went, you, Mark Zuckerberg, have blood on your hands. OK, oh, OK, gross. Lindsey Graham. Yeah. Wow. Tell me more. Uh, and then they made him apologize to the moms. 
you shall you shall apologize to so that they, he turns around all the photographers go up snap 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 oh my god he's apologizing oh my god and then you start hearing these moms talk and it sounds a lot like whenever you hear anti-gun activism or that it's really like the the tool is evil one mom was telling her story well my son killed himself after his friends blackmailed him with nudes through facebook messenger dude they could have done that through gmail through yeah. any of like how'd they get the nudes yeah if someone texts me right now i know where you live and i'm gonna kill you do i verizon has blood on their hands for yeah, what they've retarded. done to me no it, it was moronic but zuck kind of indulged this and part he should well he created this world so i don't really care uh, yeah I, know. I mean but that's the thing like i don't like siding with zuck but in a spectacle like that i have to it was so preposterous I, I don't know why he would subject himself to that well he's autistic so none of this affects him emotionally so uh, a, a drunk downtown. driver killed my son so i yell at the ford ceo yeah. Like, okay. Well, how dare you? did this you? with guns. God. Blood on your hands. <laughs> the lesson we can all learn from Aiden um, everyone who goes to next year's January 6th have filmed gay butt sex on Nancy Pelosi's desk and nothing will happen to you. Congratulations, Bonnie Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is the lesson. That's what you have to do. It's the only way. Yeah. Take That's one, disgusting. Only, take one for the team. Butt sex for the right. You heard it here. Yep. Uh, Imperious. This pisses me off. Okay. Blonde is such a hypocrite. All this moaning about why it's needing more kids. And she and her rich husband call it quits at two. God forbid you have to do any work. Listen, <laughs> I, I have had three miscarriages. Two of them were very early. And one of them was really traumatic. And it was a 10 and a half weeks. I'm 36. My husband is 43. And we got together when I was in my twenties, but he got deployed and all this other shit. And, and then the miscarriages, we, it was just uh, delaying childbearing. So what you're telling me, is that I need to go above replacement, even at great personal detriment to my physical and mental health. You can go fuck yourself. I did what I needed to do, which is give my kid a sibling. And now I'm done and I'm happy with my family and my husband's happy with my family size. Also, he's not that rich. I'm very rich. Jeez. Uh, I will just point out that uh, you'll be pregnant by this time next year. So you guys, you and Imperius will come together. Bro, I can, pre this pregnancy was so hard. I had 30 pounds of baby and amniotic fluid and placenta just like sitting on me. It was just, it was just a nightmare. Like I, I, I don't want to do this again. I'm happy. Are you I'm really going to allow me kids. to win the race of populating the white? For sure. <laughs> yeah. I don't give a shit. I'm, I'm not, right. I'm not doing this. And then this thing of everybody acting like, um, like how many kids do you have imperious i have reached replacement my child has a sibling i'm happy here like i i cannot go through another miscarriage I, I can't do it like i i emotionally i cannot do it and i can't go through another pregnancy either and it's good to know that about yourself um and i'm old you know i'm 36 even that this pregnancy was so much harder than the last one. And I was 32 with Emily. He is laughing at you from his Duggar fortress right now. He has 19 children. Yeah, no, I'm sure he's, he's jerking off like alone in his yeah. mother's basement and has no kids. Um, you probably have no idea the amount of work that goes into this. You have two kids. This is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Uh, it does. And you know, it is a lot of work. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm very thankful to be in a situation where I can have my uh, my wife be their primary caretaker. And, of course, my parents are around to help out, too. So yep. anyway, uh, thank you, Imperius. Appreciate uh, your support Whatever. for the Go show. Go fuck yourself, Imperius. <laughs> I'm taking your money. And I'm going to use it to add to this supposed pile of cash that I have. Uh, dumbass mother. Okay. GR token <laughs> spick. Um, hello, my niggas. Congrats on the new baby. Thanks for the Sandy safe space and your lame movie opinion. Stop watching the gay FL and gay bowl. Don't give your money to people who hate you. Find a new league and new entertainment. Just uh, let them enjoy this one thing. Just, just first give of all, this thank, one thing. thank you for -nigga. pronouncing it correctly. Um, the Super Bowl, though. To be clear, um, it's not like a personal entertainment thing. Like, will I have it on? Yeah. I mean, but I'm not de I'm not delaying the show for my own personal enjoyment. I'm delaying the show because in general, competing with the Super Bowl is a is a poor idea. It's a not a good idea. Yeah. So it's it's that like, you know, I, I get it. And I, I'm not denying that I enjoy my gay football. 
I do enjoy gay football. I wish it was more of an, an escape than it is. Um, but it's not like, for instance, I still do the show when there's a Vikings game on Sunday nights. In fact, I did that this season. So trust me when it's, um, when the, the show take, the show is more important than just my own gay football enjoyment. Uh, <laughs> the Super Bowl is just kind of, it's, it's like an American cultural event. And, uh, I just don't think it's wise to try to compete in that time slot. Although, yeah. you know, there's a counter to that too. For years, we competed with the Game of Thrones <laughs> I, uh, I forgot slot. about that. And we that did was okay. terrible for the show. Well, we we did it. We did it. So, <laughs> I, I mean, I take your point. I it I'm not it's not just because of my own gay football enjoyment though. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Uh Jonathan Prezios. Hey guys, I didn't get to Sir last week cuz I fell asleep, but I posted about the murder in London that killed three on camera, got no prison time due to mental illness. I want to hear what Blunt thought. When did this happen? I've been I haven't read news except for today since I had the baby. Mm-hmm. Uh, this was referenced. Was this referenced in a chat last week? I can't remember, Jonathan. Or was it the last time that Blonde was on? But yeah, this was know. a London, a, a murder in London on camera, no prison, mental illness. We'll have to come back to it. Or Jonathan, I tell you what, if you could email me a link to the story, because I just don't know the story. I'll be happy to check it out. And um, I can I can send that Blonde's way to if you'd like. Uh, but I just don't know. And I, 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 uh, I will have to uh, I will have to circle back. Um, Mint, let me read these in succession. Um, Actually, succession. someone sent me a new one for that. Definitely worth checking into. That's what we're I worry that a lot on the right wing uh, don't have the stomach to do what is needed to correct things like immigration, handling mass deportations and related would likely be a very bloody affair. It's easy to meme about expelling people. What happens when violent resistance occurs? Does the right have the iron in their hearts to accept the violence that follows? This is why the right needs a strong vanguardist movement and leave behind notions of democracy or will of the people we're correct because we are correct and not because of popularity i i think that we we don't have that currently i mean i think there's a small subsection of people on the right that um would take care of business if need be but i do i think it's the majority i think i think the majority of people are non-violent constitutional conservatives um, but then there's a lot of people like you that are nonviolent constitutional conservatives unless appropriately provoked. I'm pretty sure you could kill some people. Uh, I, I, thank provoked, you for the, I said that. Thank you for the vote of confidence. I, yeah, I mean, I, I, all I could do is hope that if the situation demanded it, demanded it, that I'm capable of doing what is necessary to defend my family and my community. I have no testing in that arena. I have no idea. I, just, I hope I would step up, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, on, on this point of, um, sort of the democracy will of the people are, are, are secondary values to, um, moral correctness, I suppose. I, I find that to be a really interesting point. It's one thing we used to just talk about on the, on the call-in show a lot too, when we talk about constitutional monarchies versus democracy and all this, uh, I'm very sympathetic to that point as long as the right to leave is preserved, like for the, yeah. for people who disagree with, with you know, what, what is being done in this society, this, um, this society that is morally correct. And that's where it derives its power. As long as those who disagree, those who are dissidents are free to leave and everybody is participating voluntarily. I really don't have a problem with that. Uh, it, it's only if people were held captive in that scenario that that would, that I would find a moral issue. So yeah, it's an interesting yeah. concept. Um, the, the only counter I would have to it is I just, uh, I, I would agree that, that things are right based on a moral principle, not because they're decided democratically. That is to say, if we all vote to kill a guy in cold blood, it doesn't make it not murder. Correct. There's a moral yeah. principle that, d- that determines whether that's right or wrong. My only dispute with, with this sort of theoretical society is just, is there any human or group of people that are capable of the sort of the sort of flawless moral determination necessary to have that kind of unchecked authority or unchecked power? I just don't think that's no, a real person. Not. Yeah. But I know Mint is a thoughtful guy, so he probably has some counter to that or some way that I'm misunderstanding or mischaracterizing that I'm sure he'd come back with. But I'm I'm pretty fascinated by those topics. Like I, I agree that democratic decision making is only as valuable as the morality behind it. If it's democratic decision-making to do horrible things, 
immoral things, then what's the value there? That's not. And why, why even bother? Yeah. yeah. And so point taken on that for sure. Um, Citizen seven, Matt, wait, did I just read that? No, Matt, I need to correct you. Those migrants released after beating NYPD officers were done. So without bail, just thought you should know. This is the clown world we live in. Did I, I thought, say with bail? I thought that's what we said, but yeah, if we or if we uh, if we said it improperly, uh, that's what we meant. Obviously, yeah. They sorry, don't have. Sorry. They don't have. Uh, that's why apparently they can't arrest them for whatever's going on now. At least the the uh, New York uh, Police Department, because they don't have. Um, uh, unless they fail to show up to their court date, they haven't actually shown any sort of violation. But Jacko. Yeah. They have homes that they are buying things for. They're here on tour deployment and sending plunder and spoils back to return to at our expense. It's infuriating. No one's doing anything about it. I know. Yeah. If that's true, that they're having pools installed at their homes with stolen Apple Pay information, that's hilarious. I guess the work environment in, in Venezuela is not that bad if you can be a pool contractor. The pool guys there are doing great. I mean, apparently. <laughs> Jonathan Prezius. We all forgot about Kamala. Kala Ma Harris are of immigration and her name doesn't even come up with any immigration talking point surprised to even see Dr. Phil mention it. Yeah. Mm. I for, yeah. That was while you were, you were out. Dr. Phil is actually down at the border doing a border documentary saw. and talking shit about Kamala Harris. Yeah. Good Lord. Um, Ryan Haas blonde, the pictures that Matt showed of your beautiful family are truly heartwarming. I'm so happy for both of your families. I just like to say, but sex have a great week but x but we love you you're very special thank you ryan i hope you're doing well man. appreciate <laughs> it um robo steve thank you citizen seven matt never mind you did in fact initially say without bail a member in the chat fact check me i misheard you oh okay yeah Thanks. i'm i'm if if i said something to the contrary that was just a simple misspeak because that's the whole controversy here is yeah, we're just gonna let them go and uh and they have no obligation to us they can we know they're, I guess at the time we didn't know they were part of a theft ring. Yeah. But uh, one might argue that um, if you are in this country on yet to be adjudicated terms, which is what their alleged asylum claim is, and you commit a violent crime, well, while those uh, uh, questions of law are still being determined, that maybe the validity of, of those questions of law should be assumed to be um Invalid. They should assume to be. We, we should assume those. Uh, your asylum claim is yeah. bullshit. Is is yeah, the technical yeah, yeah, yeah. term? Uh, I'm at a loss <laughs> for words because it's that that time of night. But uh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> Mighty Balzac. Mm. Matt and I made love in the Senate room when he pulled out. Nope. I'm uh. Uh-uh. The poor immigrant had to clean up all of our bodily mixed bodily functions. I'm not reading that. I'm. You are gay. I wish you it really had a punchline. Gay. It doesn't even have a punchline. It's just, we had gay sex and it was disgusting. <laughs> you are gay. As opposed to that gay sex is not disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> Robo Steve, congrats, Blonde. Hope your baby is as lovely and as great as you with your tiny nose. Not going to be niggardly. Thank you. We appreciate that. Thank Tortuga. You Matt, so you don't feel left out. Your nose is looking pretty slim, too. Also, Ooh. Matt and Blonde. Hoodie rocks. Oh, we have a hoodie. That's cool. Uh, he he apparently purchased one, or perhaps was he one of them? Oh, Tortuga! No, Tortuga got one because he was one of the selected chatters from oh, the uh, right. from the hydroponics kit giveaway. So I'm glad you received it. The, anytime those hoodies are sent, or any of those goods are sent internationally, it's kind of a question as to whether they eventually will it or get not. there. I'm glad to hear it did. Um, I have a terrible headache. Can you read the rest of these? Yeah. Uh, do, MX, is that I'm going to turn off my lights if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, MX2D, there's a roaming strike, a roaming stroke in DC that jumped from Fetterman. Oh, people are getting like Fetterman by proxy. Fetterman's cool <laughs> now. Did you see that he split it's from weird. his wife? He split from I his wife. I did see that he split from his well, wife. Or that's yeah. the rumor. If Fetterman yeah. has left that crazy lady, I mean, I guess I shouldn't advocate for um, divorce or whatever's going on, but there's just... Sometimes, though. There's something... Fetterman is happening. Something has awoken in that man. He's he's, he's on welcome. his way to based Frankenstein. Okay, he's he's like he's halfway right. there. Plum Logan uh, found uh, funding the Saudi war on Yemen should have been the legitimate reason to impeach Trump. Yeah, that's fair too. I mentioned the the strikes, but yeah, there was 
a lot of um, indirect action that was taken to easy prosecution. The Dems uh, couldn't do it because it would e- equally implicate Obama slam dunk case and they couldn't touch it. I suppose that probably was the reason why they wouldn't do it, although they're no strangers to hypocrisy either. But the thing about Obama and, and Obama's use of of sort of similar tactics, never forget that he legit killed a U.S. citizen overseas extrajudicially right. by blowing him up with a drone. Yeah. How that is not like that's that's sorry. That's straight murder of a U.S. citizen. And yeah. I get it. There were suspicions about that guy and who his associations no one ever talks were about it, and what whether he was trafficking with terrorists or not. He was a U.S. citizen droned without any sort of of uh trial by jury any sort of due process just straight murdered by obama and that that not only was that not impeached there was never really any talk of it as far as i'm aware that there was never serious movement on that two dogs mike d what is the depressed lesbian singing and saying in the outro what um what outro I, I don't I don't know the specific spot that you're talking about, two dogs. But if you have a question about what a soundbite is, you can email me and I'll be I'll be able to clarify. Because um, in the outro, the only thing is just Raju Muhan. I have a little Raju Muhan bit. Oh, the depressed. I have no idea what he's talking. Oh, about. are you talking about this show? You're, you're talking about Bearing and Sugar Tits song. That's a cover of um, Catch the Wind. That's oh, not yeah. depressed lesbianism. They're a married couple, yeah. and they have For excellent voices. I will mm-hmm. not have them smeared in this way. <laughs> Mike D. Thanks for supporting the show. <laughs> Russell Dufresne says, uh, unlike your Spaceball reviews, your Soylent Green reviews, or your your review is pretty fair. Spaceball sucks ass, okay? It, That's it as fair really as I get it. with that. So I continue to offer my support if Matt will give me his Super Bowl prediction. Thanks and best. Well, I may have ruined your offer for support by saying that Spaceball sucks ass. No, I... For, I hate the Super Bowl matchup this year, um, and obviously it comes in the context of a a struggle with the NFL in recent years because of all their social justice and left-wing propaganda nonsense. But I hate the 49ers just because I hate them. They're they're a gay football team from a gay city. (laughs) And I don't know. I just hate them. I just hate that everyone loves them. I hate that everyone loves Brock Purdy. I hate everything about the 49ers. I also hate uh, Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs, though, and not just because they win, but because Patrick Mahomes is a whiny bitch and appeals to the (laughs) refs all the time. And his brother is a weirdo. His dad just got arrested on DUI again today or some nonsense. But the real reason I hate Patrick Mahomes, not just because he wins all the time, it's because if you watch the quarterback uh, documentary, which featured Kirk Cousins, which is why I wanted to check it out. Quarterback of the Vikings and a good Christian family man who is total contrast to the the absolute degeneracy of Patrick Mahomes. I hate him and his wife. They're just insufferable characters. If you watch them in this documentary in their everyday life, they're They're just terrible. They're like really annoying high school kids. Mm. I can't describe it. It's just, I just, I hate, I hate both teams. So whoever loses, I'll be happy, I guess. And I can't wait to be propagandized by the commercials. If you want my <laughs> serious prediction about who wins, I don't know, man. I, whether it's – it's yeah. obviously Mahomes is skilled at what he does, and I do believe there's some legitimacy to refs being on his side. And if you're really tinfoil about it, the NFL is nothing but a propaganda narrative to prop up the romance between Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey anyway, so that they all I'm t- here for it. They I tell us like to it. vote Biden. So the Chiefs have to win, I think, for legitimate football reasons or total propaganda reasons, whether what we're watching is is absolutely fair or totally fake. Both point to a Chiefs win to me. So that's what I'm going with. And the 49ers just keep losing Super Bowls. That's that's what they do from Kaepernick to uh, Garoppolo. Purdy will continue the tradition. Doug Blask. You need 0.1 more kids to reach replacement. That's true. You need to have a tenth of a kid. A leg needs to come okay. out of there or something. One leg. Yeah. I, I'll do that. Esoterica Unbound says you missed the 70s dystopian movie where the, the pop collapse or the population collapses, causing people are. Which causes people to be. Uh, digitally obsessed to procreate kids are sterilized to affirm sexual deviance and people die by the millions from having too much to eat. Uh, Or I missed it. He said, did I say you missed? He said, I missed. You did. The baby just woke up. I got to go downstairs. Okay. Are you, you're signing off for the night. You think? 
I think we're about done anyway. I think we're done. Okay. That, that's it, isn't Let it? Me, uh, I, there's a couple more here, but I, uh, Injured Guardian, you misunderstand Matt's solid mid assessment in Titanic was referring to the woman who was being drawn, which Blonde found to be very inaccurate. Thank oh, you for clarifying. Yeah. Kate's 20 year old Kate Winslet is clearly a smoke show. Uh, two dogs, Mike D. As I try to catch the wind, is all I ever understand. What's that crunchy Lesbo saying before that? No. Oh my God, just uh, freaking out. I gotta go. All right. I will see you guys next week. Congratulations. Um, and Thank you so uh, much. We'll see you Sunday. Right. Um, yes, it is. Uh, it is uh, Bearing in Sugar Tits, and it's a cover of a song called Catch the Wind. Look up the lyrics to Catch the Wind, and uh, that's how you find it. Uh, what is going on here? I just wanted to. There we go. Technical difficulties. That's what I wanted to get up there. Ironically, having technical difficulties trying to achieve it. I think we're all set though. Uh, one more over on rumble late to the party says it's not the violence. It's the price exacted by the state. They will destroy families with no pity. And most don't want to do that to their families. Who will be the sacrificial lambs? Um, yeah. Is, is this in the context of the migrant stuff? Or is this in the context of the Montana thing? I don't know. My brain's too fried to differentiate at this point, but, um, but yeah, who will be the sacrificial lambs to the experimentation of state separation of families? Yeah, that's uh, that's a path you don't necessarily want to go down. And that's why I don't want to be too dismissive of that Montana story. Like, I understand the skepticism is necessary. Um, I just uh, I need to see a little bit more to believe it in full. Uh, thank you. Late to the party. I think we're all set on Rumble. Looks like we're good on Odyssey. Appreciate you guys there. Good over on DLive. Thank you guys over there. And we're all set on YouTube and Tippy. So even though the song has now been uh, has now been defamed, I will, as is tradition, play our outro, which is, I guess, is a, a crunchy lesbian song from Pairing and his wife Sugar Tits. I think it's a great song. And you know, true story, my wife selected this song to be played as we walked out of our wedding because we met through the show and it was a beautiful moment so how dare you defame it, it matters a lot it uh, holds a special place in my heart now uh, thanks for tuning in thanks for supporting the show appreciate you guys of course congratulations to blonde and her family and um thank you guys for your chats tonight and your live contributions to the show as well if you are listening later on demand thank you kindly as well appreciate uh, all your support for the show if you'd like more to listen to including again my Wednesday show where I've got some great interviews check out the website mattchristensenmedia.com everything you need is over there we will be back next Sunday because if it's Sunday it is not meet the press it is the Matt and Blonde show have a great night